Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 4th, 2021 Holliston School Committee meeting. It is 7.03. I'm calling this meeting to order. Pursuant to the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Paragraph 20, as well as the Select Board's emergency order dated March 16th, 2020, the Holliston School Committee will be using remote participation for this meeting. The audio of the meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the HCAT webpage within 24 hours in accordance of the governor's emergency action requirement of keeping the public informed of actions during this meeting. I ask that all participants remotely attending please state your name for identification purposes each time you speak. At this time, I will call roll call attendance. Mr. Morton. Present. Mrs. Lestevnik. Present. Ms. Koshin. Present. Dr. Savard. Present. Ms. Naborski. Present. Ms. Hanstad. Present. Mrs. Raffi. Present. At this time, I'll accept a motion um, to approve uh, remote participation for this meeting. Moved by Lisa. Seconded by Catherine. Moved by Lisa, seconded by Catherine. All in favor, roll call vote. Ms. Hanstead? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Sorry, I'm getting confused. Uh, Mrs. Lestevnik? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mrs. Raffi? Yes. Great. Good evening and welcome everybody. Um, the superintendent had reached out to me earlier this week and she had requested um, that we have a moment of silence this evening to start off our meeting. Um, there have been multiple um, Holliston Public Schools uh, community members who have experienced um, a death in the family. Um, so last week, Mr. Boudet shared about um, Mr. O'Connell, who is a longtime administrator here. Um, and then we, you know, we've just had, um, you know, in particular the past two months, but really the year, um, students, teachers, school committee members, administrators, former school committee members have experienced a loss. So I just want to take a moment to, um, you know, think of all of them and all of our families. Thank you. Okay, first on the agenda, um, we have meeting minutes from August 20th. And again, I just want to remind the committee and the public that um, one person is doing the meeting minutes for us. And if we have a three hour meeting, it's a three hour meeting that she needs to watch and record. And we've had many, many, many meetings. So she's trying to catch up by doing um, some from the beginning of the year and some from most recently. So that's why we're approving minutes for August at this point. Are there any questions, comments, changes, anything to August 20th, 2020? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the meeting minutes August 20th, 2020? Moved by Don. Seconded by Catherine. Moved by Don, seconded by Catherine. All in favor, Mr. Morton? Yes. Mrs. Lestevnik? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Ms. Hanstead? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Mrs. Raffi? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and on to individual uh, and public comment. We do not have any public comment. Uh, we don't have anyone registered this evening, so I'm going to move right over to the students. So Julia and Elise. Um, yes, so uh, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'll go. Um, so we have um, heard some news about our senior events. So prom where planned was officially canceled, but we know that um, our student um, officers along with administration has been working to think about some different plans for what we could do for our um, end of year activities. So those are all still kind of in the works and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that later. Um, the Student Record One Act 
aired um, last weekend, and um, that was a um, super fun event for all of us, and we're really excited that we were able to share those with the community. Um, the scholarship information for seniors went out today, um, and it seems like they have moved to a really exciting virtual system for that, um, which will make it a lot easier for everybody to get everything together, especially in this time, um, by submitting um, scholarship information virtually through Google Classroom as opposed to the paper system that we've had and that they've had in the past. We also have um, our Fall 2 sport. They're starting to have games upcoming. And then last night we had the open house for our third term classes. Great. Anything else, ladies? All right. Well, as always, if you, whenever you need to leave, just do the wave. Um, but thank you for that update and good luck filling out all those scholarship applications. Thank you. All right. The committee, does anyone from the committee have anything they want to share tonight? Anybody? Cynthia? Um, I just wanted to share that it is um, Women's History Month and International Women's Day is March 8th, just for the community. That's it. Good. Anyone else? I just wanted to say wahoo to the virtual scholarship system. <laughs> Yeah, that is, sometimes there are just some small teeny silver linings to this pandemic, and that's one of them, because for years that has been a heavy paper-based system, and I think this can make everybody's lives better, the students and the reviewers on the other end. So whoever put it together through the World Classroom, maybe it was guidance, I'm not sure. Um, lots of credit to you. That's, that's a great improvement in the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, administrators, Peter? Yeah, today was uh, Class and Tina celebrated the 100th day, so they had a great time over there. I saw one poster that won, uh, it's a, a newer student to our school created, which had 100 um, important uh, black people uh, throughout history uh, with all different uh, types of, uh, you know, roles. Um, uh, in addition, that kind of built on at the end of February, they were highlighting black um, individuals, both you know, authors, scientists, mathematicians, athletes, politicians, activists. And then this week, they've been in the midst of a Read Across America Week, which um, the theme of the week uh, throughout the nation is celebrating a nation of diverse readers. Uh, and what they've done is they have a whole um, a read aloud each day um, on a different theme. Um, the first, uh, with, with very diverse characters and diverse themes. Uh, day one was books that celebrate you. Day two is books that about taking action. Book, day three was books that celebrate your own voice. Day four was with books that give different perspectives. And day five was book, books that influence Americans. And uh, they've created these digital bookshelves. So in addition to the read aloud um, that they might be doing in the school, they also have all these other books around those different themes that um, uh, that uh, um, Dr. Slaney and um, Zlasi and uh, Linda Canal have created along with our teachers. So it's a really uh, fun celebration and really kind of highlighting, uh, again, the, the diversity of, of characters in the world and our diverse readers we have here in Holliston and beyond. It's a fun week. Yeah, I love seeing the pictures of all the little kiddos dressing up. Keith, do you have anything tonight? And Susan? You have a couple of things that I want to talk about. Uh, one thing I just want to say to the seniors, because we do want to make sure this is a special year for them, as hard as it's been for everyone. I really think we can come up with some creative solutions. So maybe it won't be a traditional prom, but I really think we could come up with some kind of outside event that would allow students to have um, a fun night, um, maybe under tents of some sort. And I'm happy to support some of that work with, I know the seniors are meeting with parents and I know they're meeting with administration so I'll certainly stay in the loop because I really do want to help them come up with a solution that may not be perfect but I think it'll be a fun event that we can come up with so students stay tuned we'll, we'll support you somehow with that and then I did want to mention um, the other day when I visited Miller um, and just on my rounds I was happy to see and forgive me I will forget which class I was in but the, there were our students in our French immersion program were actually zooming 
with a class in France. And that was exciting to see because I was asking some of the students um, if this was the if they'd been doing this for a while. And I think it was it happened to be the first time that they had connected with this class. So I want to return and hear more about how that online communications going. But it just what a great opportunity to be able to zoom right into another class in France. We have all these resources to do so. So, so should we cover, I want to encourage that as much as possible. Uh, another event that's coming up that I'm really excited about, um, as I've told the school committee, we are partnering with the Mass, excuse me, this is my voice tonight, the Massachusetts Partnership for Diversity in Education. And I've been working on a virtual job fair. I'm on the subcommittee with that group and we've been planning a virtual job fair for people of color in particular to encourage diversity and encourage many people from different walks of life to come join our district. It's a great place to work and our students deserve to have some role models that resemble them in diverse positions. So the job fair is going to be on March 31st and I'm working with Lisa Deluzio to set up our virtual job platform. I'll be sharing more about that. You'll see some flyers coming out and I want to get our TBD are positions that we believe are going to be anticipated for the fall out there so that our administrators can be on the job fair platform with me and we can actually do some live interviews by Zoom with some of these candidates. So I'm excited for that. It's something I've done in previous districts and I wanted to bring that to Hollistings. I think it's a great opportunity for all of us. And then the last thing I just wanted to thank the staff yesterday I did I've been doing virtual not virtual and in-person check-ins with staff because we have to connect in different ways and get to know one another. So I've done that different days at different buildings. But yesterday was my first virtual coffee hour with staff after school. And I was really grateful that a number of staff came to talk with me. We, we know that there are a lot of questions right now with vaccinations, cool testing, all the things that parents and families and community are worried about, our staff are worried about as well. And while I may not have all the answers, I enjoy talking with staff and trying to support one another and collaborate together. So thank you to all of them that arrived to uh, my first coffee hour yesterday. So that's all I have for right now. Great. That's great. Thank you for that. Uh, this evening, um, we've invited um, our townwide PTO president, uh, Sarah Fitzgerald. She's also, uh, the way our structure is, she's also president of the middle school. And Barbara Ryan is the uh, chairwoman for Mindshare, which is uh, helping to educate parents. Um, so I just wanted to um, welcome them and share with you that um, the PTO has really um, intentionally been quiet in terms of fundraising this year. Um, not that they don't want to raise money and, and support teachers and staff and administrators, um, but they really wanted, or we, because I'm part of the PTO, really wanted to take a step back, let us get the schools reopened, um, and just be there sort of as, as a quiet presence, if you will. And at the holidays, um, the PTO was able to go downtown to different Holliston businesses, and they bought gift cards um, in over $2,000 worth of gift cards that were then given to um, Jackie Weiner at Youth and Family Services. So sort of a little bit of giving back, supporting um, the businesses and, and some of our families. So, um, and the PTO has also done a couple of the um, pandemic parenting. They've helped support that. So, you know, quiet this year, but, you know, they're in, in the background there, um, silently supporting. So the reason why we invited them tonight is I wanted them to share um, some of their most recent work with the district um, for diversity and inclusion. So with that, I welcome uh, Sarah and Barbara. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having us. I am Barbara Ryan and speaking for both Sarah and I with her concurrence um, with what we'd like to share and with the support of Dr. Kuska, Dr. Botello, Lisa Kosha, and obviously our school committee liaison and in collaboration with Diverse Holliston um, and Jackie Weiner from Family News Services. Uh, we've had a um, these group members, school teachers and administrators, um, we've just recently completed an eight hour equity training um, that through the PTO and even talking with school committee, Stacy, thank you. Uh, we spent some of the money 
um, that the Mindshare program had to support this training. And again, thank you for all of your support with that. And what we're doing now is we're continuing the dialogue toward next steps on the same in regards to parent education series and some community events. And the goal is to acknowledge, educate, and positively influence our community and culture and work to help um, provide educator PD work in concert if we are able to do that financially or through some, some of these programmatics um, and move towards um, the possibility of up updating curricula. Um, we particularly, HPAS, uh, Mindshare, and PTO would like to thank Dr. Patello, um, school committee member Lisa, and all the participants again in our recent um, uh, training. It's It was two hours a week over a four week period. And um, I just thank them for their commitment because that's just another thing to add on all of their plates. So we really appreciate that partnership. The other thing I'm really excited to share on our behalf is uh, we wrote, or I wrote a grant for the first time in December. It was who's gonna do it, who wants to do it? And I was like, Okay, I've never done it, but I'll do it. And um, not to say, isn't that great, but the great part is we wrote to the Mass Cultural Council, the Holliston chapter, and we applied for it. And we just received notice just two weeks ago that we were awarded the amount of $1,000 towards this effort, which is really incredible. And so we wanted to share that with all of you first, and we'll be sharing that with our uh, diverse Holliston um, teammates, if you will, and our next meeting, which will happen next week. So we're really sincerely thankful to the committee, not only for its consideration, but this very generous grant. Uh, again, our next steps include uh, this whole group working toward um, parent and guardian engagements through our outlet HPS Mindshare. And again, our first post-training meetings next week. That's what I have, and to wrap, I'd like to say thank you personally uh, for all your efforts that are keeping my children and all our children and the teachers healthy, safe, and happy, and in the classroom. It's gonna be great to go back to their brick and mortar. Selfishly, as a mother, it'll be nice to have my kids in school five days a week, um, but I just see in this hybrid model how positive it's been for them here and here to be in school with classmates and teachers and those kind of engagements. So thank you humbly for all that you've been doing and that you continue to do. And that is what we have to present. And we thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Barbara, and congratulations. So people don't, She what she didn't share was, um, wasn't it only up to $500 that grant and somehow you got a thousand out of them. So for your first time writing that grant, you're hired. Uh, Dr. Patello, did you want to add anything? I know you alluded to the training a little bit at our last meeting, but did you want to um, add anything else to to what Barbara shared? No, I just thank Barbara for her uh, leadership in like inviting us uh, to participate and just um, uh, you, you, it's so clear how passionate and positive she is in this role. And, and we really appreciate her, uh, her efforts as well as uh, Barbara Fritz from uh, Diverse Halls and, and Sarah as well. Lisa, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I just also want to thank Barbara and everybody with Diverse Holliston and Mindshare for this opportunity. And also let you know that we got our, we got some of the resources um, in the mail, got a hard copy. Um, but we also, um, Dr. Patel and I also talked to um, the Tony Walker, the woman who ran it for us about putting some resources online and she agreed and sent us um, so we're going to work on figuring out how we might be able to post something. Already done. They're, they're posted up there uh, on the district uh, news. Uh, oh, site. awesome. So, yeah. Oh, There's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, that was fast. Great. So everybody go look for that. Which tab is it under? It's under uh, district news. Under district news. Okay. So district I encourage people to go take a look because I thought, you know, one of the really cool things about the program was just, you know, her being able to, curate the resources for us because there are so many resources out there and i think she did a great job of presenting some that are particularly um timely and and interesting so yeah everybody go check it out and thanks again 
That's Thank you. Good. I just have one alibi. What she also provided us, you made me think of, are two strategic pathways ahead, one for the school and one for the community. So again, another great resource. And in the Let's Talk About series, she's agreed to be a panel member that we're shaping that run a show for. Um, and we're hoping to have something in the April timeframe that we can put out to the community like we did in the spring, the Let's Talk About Pandemic Parenting series. So thank you for letting me um, add that in. And thank you kindly for, for having us tonight and the support. Well, that's great. Any questions from the committee? Anybody? Okay, we'll check out those resources. Sarah, Barbara, thank you so much for your leadership and um, keep doing the great work. We'll have you back again at the end of the year. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, that's awesome news. Okay, subcommittee reports. So I know some of us will be, we're gonna do some communications with the newsletter. We're gonna talk about the budget. So let me jump to policy first. Cynthia, anything to update on policy? Um, our next meeting is on Tuesday, March 9th at 1 p.m. Just our ongoing review. We have a couple of policies we're looking at. One is um, JICH, which is a prohibition of drugs and alcohol. That's a big one that we're tackling on. Tuesday predominantly. There's a couple others, but that's the big one. Andy, quick update on superintendent evaluation, anything? Yeah, um, I intended to earlier this week and get to it. So I will tonight at some point during the meeting, send an email um, to Don and to Cynthia uh, to coordinate a time that we can get together with Susan to talk about the process for the evaluation. But um, right now we're still on target for the timeline, the rough timeline that I laid out last week. So we'll, I'll send out the communication in a few minutes and hopefully we can before the end of the meeting, nail down the time um, next week to meet. Great. And Louise, anything for budget other than, I mean, we're gonna talk about budget the next one, but anything else? No? Okay. Lisa, uh, communications, did you wanna set up office hours? Yes. So we had a, a communications meeting this week, yesterday, I think, and um, went over some, as Dawn, Catherine, and I met with Dr. Kuska to talk about um, our communications as well as, you know, uh, what we want to do going forward. And um, so I have two items that I want to highlight on that. One is, yes, I want to set up office hours. So um, let's do that second. The other thing that um, we came up with that we wanted to discuss, and this is an item that we thought we could ask to have put on the next agenda and just give you guys a heads up now as kind of a report out from our meeting. Yep. Um, but we were hoping at the at our next full committee meeting, we could talk about um, an idea from Hopkinton where they have people email in questions and then they take the communication subcommittee could sort of, you know, own that mailbox maybe and, um, pick a few questions that we could answer under public comments. Um, so we don't have to get into a full discussion about it tonight because I know we're springing it on you, but that is something we talked about in our subcommittee meeting as a way of helping people feel more heard and answering some common questions. And we envisioned it being around, you know, maybe four or five questions, part of sort of the, in the public comment period you know, it'd be questions that we would send to Susan or the appropriate administrator ahead of time and just kind of read out answers to these as almost like a FAQs kind of thing. Yes. So your communication subcommittee would humbly like to ask you to think about this for the next couple of weeks and we can have a, a fuller discussion on it as an agenda item at our next meeting. And then yep. we also just wanted to kind of present this to Dr. Cusca, Dr. Patello, see what you guys think and, and uh, you know, give you a heads up and maybe think about discussing this at our next meeting. But it's something that Hopkinton does and it's an idea that struck us as something that would be a new and different way for us to allow people to feel like, you know, allow people to feel like they're really being heard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was part one. Part two is office hours. Um, when do we want to do them? How many do we want to do? Um, I mean, we'll we talk about Zoom one, please. I'm sorry. 
Are you talking about Zoom ones or are you talking about in person? I'm talking about Zoom ones. I okay. have no desire to do in person. If someone else wants to do in person, you can go for it. Um, I would say Zoom office hours. You know, we traditionally have done it on a, like a Saturday coffee haven, maybe around 10 in the morning. And then we've usually picked a weeknight, you know, Casey's seven o'clock. If we're not going to do in person, you know, I think we should still stick with a couple of times like that. You know, I think some people are more available on weekends. Some people are more available on weeknights. Um, so I was going to throw out maybe a few dates, maybe try to do a couple of these in March um, and just see who wants to volunteer. We, you know, we have to have no more than three people because um, that's more for Catherine than the rest of you. But, you know, so we don't have a quorum because mm -hmm. it's not an, immediate, not an official meeting. Um, so I don't know if we want to try for one next week. Is that too soon for people? Do you want to I go a week should... after that? We The nice thing is we don't have um, a school committee meeting next week. Um, you know what I think I would suggest maybe is, is trying for next Saturday, which would be the 13th, and then maybe do a weeknight a couple of weeks after that. So why don't we start with that? Why don't we start with Saturday the 13th? Who is Who would so, be available to do Saturday the 13th? Aunt Louise, hold on. I mean, Lisa, hold on one second. I just want Aunt, Aunt Louise has a question before we plan. It was um, maybe it's a suggestion. You know, I, it's interesting. We always do Saturday morning because it seemed to be an easy way to intercept people on their coffee runs and, uh, you know, sort of a welcoming spot to do it on a Saturday morning. Um, I wonder if when it's via Zoom, if that would play out, we can certainly offer it. Um, so it's just a thought that I'm wondering if maybe even a Sunday afternoon might be better. I, you know, I don't know with kids sports, like I always, rem I always remember feeling like Saturday morning we were competing with kids sports, but I don't know even what's happening right now with kids sports. Like, is there spring soccer? Is there whatever on Saturday morning? If that's your only time to get out, then um, so I don't know. We can try it. I was just wondering if maybe like if, because we're past football, maybe three o'clock Sunday afternoon or something or four would be better. I don't know. Do Saturday afternoon. How does anybody, I don't, my kids not doing sports right now or other kids are a lot of kids doing sports Saturday mornings right now. So soccer wouldn't start yeah. until the first week in April and then okay. lacrosse starts after that. So I think okay. if we're talking the, the, Saturday or Sunday in, um, in March, I think People would oh, have available. Well, they, they are doing pickup soccer games um, when the weather is okay. All right, right well, now, on Saturdays and Sunday mornings. That's let's try it. virtual coffee office hours. I mean, that'd be great. I'm happy to sit on Saturday morning the 13th with my coffee. Okay, do we want to do around 10 a.m.? So this is the 13th, Saturday, March 13th. Do we want to do around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m.? Or earlier? I guess we could do earlier. I don't really want to do much earlier. Let's do time. That's good. Okay. So who I I'll do it, and uh, I need two more people. I'll do it. Okay. So Cynthia, myself. I don't see any other hands. And Louise, is that okay? Did I miss anybody who's dying to do it? Speak now. Forever hold your peace. All right. So I'm happy to do an in person. Um. Right now nights or weekends are the better time. Um, I might be able to finagle during the day, during the week. I'm happy to meet at Coffee Haven. Okay, so let me just verify the Saturday the 13th at 10 a.m. We're gonna have Anne Louise, myself and Cynthia for an in-person one. So I'm sorry, Stacey, what time of, who else, would anybody else be willing to do? Um, in person? I'm willing to do it in person. I just can't do it during a work day. Okay. Yeah, can you do it night, Catherine? I can do night and I can do weekends, but I just, I can't do work day. So maybe I need to look up when they're open. Maybe we could do Anthony's. That's what I was going to ask because that's a bigger space. 
Okay. And they have the outside tent too. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have, to do a little, I have to do a little research, Lisa. So Catherine here. and I, and if someone else wants to join us, we'll I can join Stacy. We'll set a time, and then I'll post it, and I'll okay. An email. All right. Um, so do we want to just leave it at that for now, and then we can wait till our next meeting to schedule another one if we think we need it. Yeah. Does that work? Okay. All right. So that's it for me for now. Excellent. All right. Did I get all the subcommittees? I think I did. And now, Susan, Dr. Cusco, superintendent update. Hello again. Uh, I've been trying to keep on top of all the changes that are happening at the state level and obviously with the Commission of Education. Every day there's more information and every time I think I'm caught up, something changes. So um, I'll do my best to keep you informed of everything that I'm hearing, but there's still a lot of TBD because we're getting partial information about what the next steps are. So I asked, um, thank you to Dan McLeod and Matthew um, Cotter at the middle school has helped me out doing, putting together some of our survey data because I was trying to get it done. We closed the survey for families yesterday and to get the dashboard put up for me for today to get to the meeting. I really appreciate their help. So I thought I'd just share with you some of that survey data. And I the, I did do a staff survey as well, but that one just started. So that's not closing until Monday. But I do have a preliminary, um, just some quick percentages to share with you because I think it's helpful to understand where the families are, where the staff are, even though it's only a snapshot in time. It gives us some information as to where we are in our thought process related to further reopening of schools, um, I'm going to have Dan is going to put up a, t a new tab for us. Our fall reopening tab will be replaced with spring reopening updates. And we'll be taking some of the old things off and adding some of the new to keep parents informed of anything that is starting to come. So I'm going to, uh, Keith, uh, do I have sharing? I think I might. Yeah, I do. I'm going to share um, the surveys that, the survey data that we've started to put together for you. So we asked parents questions regarding. Um, how they felt about, as you know, the commissioner has been telling us that very recently he would like to see all students back in person, even for this year. He indicated to our superintendent groups and other places that he would be like, he wants to see our K-5 population all in person, if, if possible, for the individuals by April 5th. That's a lofty goal just because it comes with potentially not only meeting with all of you, um, meeting to make plans, meeting with our teachers and staff, trying to really collaborate with them to do it as smoothly and efficiently as possible. But on the facilities end, it requires a lot of physical moving of classrooms and furniture and things that we put away um, months ago to make sure that we could fit the, the changes related to the physical dis distancing at six feet. So the first slide that I have up here um, for data is just what the current learning models are in all of our school buildings at the district level. Right now, about 48% of our students are hybrid, about 28% are fully in person, and about 24% are fully remote, with a small, very small portion that are homeschooled. And we asked the question about pool testing. We're, again, hoping to get all of our students back as soon as possible, if possible, in a safe manner. And that would require going down to less than six feet. So somewhere between three and six feet to get a full class in, in front of the teachers. And in order to do so, we wanted to find out what parents felt would be comfortable for them. And if you look at the district data, with our current health and safety measures in place, if we were to go between three and six feet versus currently we're at six feet in person, then 70, almost 78% said they would still attend in person each day. And when I sent out the data, I had parents report for each child so that we could disaggregate the data by grade as well. So this is just an overall snapshot for the district. 21.7% said that they would continue or move to full remote. So it's, it's about consistent with the um, amount that are remote. We might get some students that would come back five days a week in person, even though they're remote. There might be a few students who are in person but don't feel comfortable at three to six feet and might change for that matter, but very small numbers. And then I have data broken down by Placentino, they're 
fairly close, but there are some differences. Let me see if I can make this shrink down a little bit. So if you look at the same information for full in person at Placentino, currently at 78%, and about 21% is um, remote, very small portion are homeschooled. If they were to come back at three to six feet, 79.4% said they would still attend in person each day with 20% saying they would continue or move to remote. So there's a slight shift to the positive there as well. And I also asked about pool testing. We offered to add pool testing as a mitigation resource. Would they participate? I put a different, last time when I sent this out to families, I put yes or no. Um, and I wanted to add not sure this time. I think people are still waiting for more information and I'll continue to share that to help people understand. But right now about 38% said they would do the pool testing on, an, on a weekly basis, 26% said no, and 35% said they're not sure. So you combine your 35 and 38, you know, you've got a, a, about 73% that if they were feeling more comfortable might go towards the pool testing. We really do need numbers like that to make pool testing successful and worthwhile. So I'll continue to send out information on that um, as we go along and hope to get more people coming along to do that with us. Susan, can I ask a question before you go on? Sure. That um, the upper left-hand pie chart there, where it's to seventy-eight point one percent, is that pie chart for the total population in Placentino right now, or is that the breakdown for the four hundred and sixty-six people who returned the survey? That is for the ones that returned the survey. Okay. I'd have to, the numbers actually. I thought when I last talked to Jamie that we had less than twenty percent that were actually fully remote. So of the respondents, I had a total of about twenty-two hundred people or 2,200 entries. So that's quite a, quite a good number for a survey. When you look at our numbers, they're about 2,800. So that really is a really high percentage rate to have, but it, it's not gonna be as accurate as what you're asking. Susan, do we know how accurate it is? Do we know what percentage of the Placentino Miller Rams High School filled out this survey? I'd have to get that separately because I had to put this together okay. for me. I'd have to 466 respondents out of Keith, you might be able to pull it. What's the full number? We might be able to put that. So that's the next level of data I could have Matt and Dan work on, but no, we didn't do that yet. We just pulled this together tonight to get some information out so parents could see it. Wait, you had 466 just at Placentino? Correct. That's, that's statistically significant. It really is. I mean, as I said, 2,200 respondents out of about 2,800 students is a really high, it is really good data. So, I'm, And I, I think what, what I'm learning is sending out frequent reminders. Parents have been great about filling this out. I usually send out three reminders, one the first day, a follow-up, and then the last one I always send a text, and I think that's really been helping to get the data. Susan, did you have an open comments section um, related to the pool testing so that people who said they weren't sure could maybe give you some indication as to what they were looking for, or you know, was there something else that would make them more comfortable with it, et cetera? I didn't at this time only because I really wanted to get the data and the percentages quickly because I wanted to have it for this conversation and knowing I had a quick turnover. And with 2,200 um, people responding, it wouldn't have been 2,200 fully, but a lot of comments. I didn't feel I had the capacity to really pull that it's down fine. together. In I a meaningful it's, it's, no, I, I often do do that. And I certainly will think of other ways to collect it about the pool testing in particular, but didn't do it on this one. Um, so the next one is at Miller. And for the respondents, about 563 respondents, it's approximately 44% were the hybrid, 23% remote, and 32, they're almost 33% in person. The numbers there, again, would be for attending, going all full in would be about 78%. Sorry, this is not quite fitting on the screen all as much as I would like. So about 78% said they would attend five days a week in person at three to six feet, and the pool testing about 47% at Miller said that they would participate, 30% not sure, and 23% said no. So again, I'm really looking at that not sure as definitely people that could potentially be part of it. And if we could get to numbers of 77% like that, that would be really strong surveillance data that we could use and be significant. Next one is from RAMS. We divided up the same data and about 70% are hybrid and 22% remote and the smaller number of 8.5% of fully in person when we just started to bring some back. 
Similarly, about 80% here said that they would do the, uh, would, would come back at three to six feet in order to have the kids in five days a week. And 20% said that they would stay or move to remote. And as far as pool testing, about 54% said yes, they would do it. About 26% said not sure. Again, we're looking then at numbers of 80%, which is exactly what they say. The really solid numbers are at 80% or more. And we did do pool testing this week at Rams for our cohort A. Had small numbers that participated, I think, in the 20-something percent range, but we made it work. And it was very seamless. It was done quickly. I was over at the building. They did a great job on it. It's a very low um, anterior nasal swab. It does not go high up into the nostrils and very painless. And uh, I think there's four little swabs. So now that the children are seeing it and the staff are seeing it, that number actually has shifted to 54% that would be interested. So that already has changed in a positive manner. And next week we'll do cohort B similarly. At the high school, about 68% remote, I'm sorry, hybrid, 27% remote and fully in person, about 4%. They also are about 75% said they would attend fully in person. So that's really good news to see that because it would be shifting some of our remote students in as well. And for pool testing, similarly about 50% said that they would do pool testing as a resource, 29% not, not sure. So again, we're up to 77% there. So if we got those kind of numbers, if they combine those two numbers, those are really solid numbers to work with. The other graphs I did wanna show you that Matt and Dan put together are just quick, and these are not final because they're still, the survey's still in process. I think I've had about 280 people respond to this one for staff. Um, would they participate in pool testing if it were available at less than six feet? And about 46% said yes, 38, 36% said not sure, and 18% said no. So again, I'm liking that not sure number because it gets me thinking that we could convince people that this is a good resource to use as we move along. And when asked if they felt that more students should come back. I mean, I think everybody thinks that they should, but safety is a concern. So about 40% said not sure yet, but 34% said yes. And again, we're looking at if the not sure feel more comfortable now that the vaccinations are rolling out, that could be a, a positivity rate of 74% feeling that we can do this. I know we can, but it's going to take time to get through the changes that are being implemented and being worked on at the time. So the reason I wanted to share all of that data with you is because, as I mentioned, the commissioner is saying that tomorrow he'll be meeting with the Board of Education and looking to um, discuss time on learning. And the vote that he's looking to have from the Board of Education is that no longer would you be able to count hybrid and he even said remote into the time on learning hours. He did note in some communication that he sent out um, yesterday or today that although remote will not count in the long term for this year, while we're still rolling out vaccinations and things, they would allow remote learning platforms for students that are already doing it if it's necessary, um, but there would no longer be an available hybrid model, and that would be right now for K to five. We're already offering full in-person for K to three, so for us, it's only four to five that would we'll be adding by April 5th, if that's the date we get to. However, it's not as simple as that because in order to move grade four and five in, we have to make changes at Placentino and potentially at the middle school as well. Um, after, oh, Ann, Louise, you want to question something? I'm here? sorry, I didn't know you were continuing, but keep going. And I, I do have a question about something you just said. I, well, if you want to pause there re related to the K-5, I, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions no, no, no. for that. But, okay. That's all right. I really didn't mean to interrupt you. Just okay. keep going. <laughs> so, <I'll> wait. <laughs> While the commissioner has said that he may not mandate six to 12 being back full in person versus hybrid and remote, certainly the data that I showed you shows that the community clearly wants their students back five days a week as much as possible in person up to 80%. So that's a K to 12 thing. I don't like to be able to just say we're going to do only for K to five if we can do it for six to 12 successfully, and I think we can. However, we may not be able to do it by April 5th. So there are a lot of things to work out and things are moving and shaking so quickly. Um, last week, I think I shared with you that I was working with the administration to see if we could shift students around and potentially get 
um, students back at six feet K to eight by the end of the year, full in person without hybrid. And with that in mind, we had a lot of challenges. And then with the shifting to say, it, there was a lot of research coming out and continuing to be shared with us that the three to six feet is considered uh, a safe distance for students with masks on and with our mitigation resources in place. There are schools that have been doing it all year and safely with very, very small amounts of transmission. So, um, you know, again, I'll share any research I get. I haven't gotten all the studies yet, but the, the commissioner did say they'll be sharing out some more studies about that research and I'll get it out to you as soon as I can. So, or, yep, Cynthia. Sorry. So I guess um, I had a couple, well, I'll just start with one question, which is about how are we gonna manage lunch? Like that's like my biggest concern of like moving us in because that's the time when the kids have their masks off for the longest period of time, not just a break. So like that's a big one. And then right now I thought that they weren't they weren't going to be counting asynchronous, but they would count synchronous learning um, because like at the high school they go home for their last block and they're they're still doing it synchronously, but they're just doing it from home. So. Well, you know, that still remains to be seen because he was a little unclear. And I think that's going to be part of the discussion that comes out tomorrow. They're meeting between two and four. So we're probably not going to hear much um, until the evening tomorrow. And, you know, I'll get out anything that I, that comes my way. He actually, it actually said that they may not even vote tomorrow. But what it, what it looks like is happening from the communication is that he is going to ex ask the board to allow him to proceed with emergency plans, meaning while they were voting and submitting comments, we would he would still go forward and implement um, having K to five back in person five days a week. Lunch is already being served at all the K to three and four or five when they're in person. Right now we're doing all K students six feet apart in the lunchroom. And right now we're doing our other grades in, per, in, in the classroom at six feet. We will plan on keeping students at six feet with math with masks off. It does not make sense to go any shorter than that, and I haven't heard any research around that. However, that is going to require us to move to other larger spaces. So we are working on that plan, and once we have more information on that, but K to five, we would be serving lunch in school. I'm going to pause because Dan Louise has a question. Um, I'll come back to lunch, but oh, okay, I'll start with that. So I just where where are you with the tent purchases? or rentals or whatever we're going to do would that assist that should assist with lunch as the weather gets warmer at this at this stage we've had very that was a very low we've had no luck with regards to finding a firm that has is willing to quote us a price even on tents at this stage so okay so i have an, a thought that may help you we can deal with it later on that um i i guess the question i have is i'm i'm not concerned about the the students were attempting to bring back that's a whole you know sort of bees nest of, of logistical challenges but the 20 odd percent depending on which building you're talking about that would go full remote or already are full remote i'm not sure how many in that mix would shift would shift toward full remote from hybrid that concerns me um and and the commissioner is saying that we're not we're not going to be given credit for time on learning for teaching those students. So what's his recommendation? We force them to come in? No, he's not saying that. He's saying because of where we are in COVID right now and with the vaccinations, um, I mean, I have the wording right here. He, he would ask the board to allow for the only full, only for full remote students, he would allow them to remain remote for this year only. But hybrid okay. model would not count. Okay, but for students who are hybrid now, and for whom, um, you know, whose families or, or them, it, whatever, do not feel comfortable shifting to, they're going to be given, now it's black and white, they're given the opportunity to come to school or not come to school. There's no hybrid. So for those students who then choose, who are hybrid now, they're going to be forced into a remote model if they don't want to come to school. Is that correct? That could happen in a few cases, but looking at the and number then, so, but but I thought what I understood you say is if they're in hybrid now, they can't go full remote and get credit. It's only those who already were in full remote. No, he will allow a shift to remote for this year, oh, year will, only. Okay. Remo remote will count. A com a combined hybrid will not count at all. Those will be the only options. With clearly encouragement of us all being in 
and not really encouraging remote, but will allow it for that short time. Okay. Uh, I, I guess the last thing I would say is I would strongly advocate that we find a solution for our middle and high school students as well. And if we have to prioritize space at the high school, I, I'm going to throw this out without having, you know, solicited feedback from parents and students, obviously, but I'm really concerned that there's a delay or a phased in approach um, at the high school, especially for our seniors who graduate two to three weeks prior to everybody else. So, you know, they might be going back, have a chance, their last chance to go back to school full time and it doesn't start till May 1st and they're out of the building in five weeks. So if there's a way to prioritize them as you think through the implementation plan, I guess I would re recommend that. Yeah, I mean, if I could, I'd have them all back on Monday. You know, I really, I, I know, you, it, I know. And, and I can talk through a few of the things that we have to work through to get any of these plans to take place. I, I just want to make sure it's, you know, they're not a holistic group, nine through 12. They've got nope. different schedules, different da -da -da, so that's just yeah. a thought. No, there. and and honestly, I mean, well, I'll talk about one of the logistical things is right now, um, in order to get the middle school back, currently, as you might remember, we moved our Montessori students over from Placentino to yeah. Rams, and it's gone wonderful. When I go visit my middle school students, I get to see the Montessori students there as well, and it's great. Um, I was there one Friday when they had Dance Friday, and they had our, our Peppy, Peppy the Penguin was dancing in the hallway, so it's been working fabulously. It's a very isolated wing, so the kids don't intermingle with the older students. It's great. However, uh, Mr. Jordan and his team would need that space back to successfully bring in all of their six to eight students. So mm -hmm. that's something that I think we need to, that's where we need to work on. The first step, the first hurdle would be, can we get grades four and five back safely, successfully for April 5th? And I think we can, but there's work to do with that. Then I think after that would be, now let's move back because they're already in K to three, but then we would have to shift back our Montessori students. And that might be better to do after vacation. So we have the vacation week to move furniture. Again, this is hypothetical right now because we haven't mapped out all the thought on this, but we need time to move all the facilities. And then once the students come back into Placentino, that would then free up that space so they could start, they could also do the same shifting over the vacation week, potentially at Rams, and have all six to eight students back that week. Again, I'm not, I don't want to lock into dates, but that's sort of the preliminary discussion. If for some reason, nine to 12, because there's, there are no shifts in moves from classrooms as far as other buildings shifting back and forth. So nine to 12 doesn't have that um, need. So if there's a way we could move our nine to 12 students back sooner than middle school, I mean, we'll do what works for each building, but each building does have different needs. So I don't want to lock us into definitive dates. If one's better to move first, we'll do that. You know, and that's the conversation we'll be having over the next couple of weeks. But we also have some um, discussion we'll be doing with our HFT. And I've already talked with Jamie Patone and let the teachers know that we want to start doing a collaborative effort to see if we can come up with some, what things might, what are the concerns, what can we work out together? And if we are able to do this with minimal effort, you know, I have some thoughts and, and I've already talked with the team a little bit, and there may be some things that might not be too complicated. If the goal is full in person and we can do that without serving lunch in six to 12, which I think we could, um, which would have us keeping the schedule that we already have. Again, we're not locked into this, but this is just one thought is we could potentially switch quickly by not having um, lunch served except for the brown bag lunch or the kids that stay all day would still have that option, but we wouldn't have to worry about finding space for the larger groups to be in. So again, that's a, a preliminary thought, but lunch, we're not saying for sure that lunch would be served in six to 12 to everyone, but it wouldn't have to be served for K to five. John? Um, so two questions, and the one is just to follow up on what you just said. So if we do not have to serve lunch for kids six through 12, we could mm -hmm. potentially get those kids back into school full day sooner? Is that what, is that what you just said? I we said we would, well, let me clarify, sir. we would still serve lunch. It's just that they wouldn't have to necessarily eat on campus. And okay. I still think we would still have that option of dismissal at 1243 so they could take lunch with them. And I think a lot of students would still stay, I mean, not stay on campus and still do that. 
So the lunch would be grab and go, and we would still have a small number of students that would be served lunch on campus and remain for the rest of the day. And similarly for high school as well. I mean, that's again, preliminary thought right now, but that would be the easier way to do it. So my question um, was, it, you'll still be a close contact if you're less than six feet, correct? So if we have 24 kids in a room, and let's say you have a kid in the middle who's positive, potentially you're gonna have four close contacts, correct? Uh, I, yeah, I have, to, I have to picture that depending on the death letter, but yes. <laughs> six feet. So would we still be able to set up something so that when those four or more close contacts, especially if it was at a high school level because they could go to three or four different classes, so multiply that out, would we still have something so those kids, if they get sick, or their close contacts would be able to zoom into the classroom and not fall behind and have to learn asynchronously for a period of one to two weeks. Would we still have the capacity to have um, Zoom classroom available, not in a hybrid model, but so that kids don't fall behind if they get sick or are close contacts? So right now the current model at the high school is that if a student is out for quarantine or is a remote student, they're still coming into class with the students in person. So again, this is a conversation we would have with our union as we talk about what, what, what are best practices and what makes the most sense, but it is the model already in place. So I would like to think that that would remain in place, but again, I can't do that with all certainty until we have that conversation. And then what about our remote kids? Would they, would they be switching teachers or would they be zooming into these classes? It's really gonna depend on who and what and how, because honestly, because the models are so different, you know, I think, like I said, at the high school, it's very likely that we, they would stay with their exact schedule. I don't foresee changes there. I can't imagine it, but, you know, it could be something that I'm not considering. At the middle school, it would also depend on, obviously, if they're shifting from remote to full in-person, they're not going to be able to potentially stay um, with the same teacher. Because, as you know, we have, some, we have some separate groups that are full remote with a separate teacher, so that might shift it. Um, and the same at the Placentino and Miller, if they're currently changing their model, certainly they, would, they might have to shift teachers. I can't really think about all the particular cases that might be an outcome. If we did have a shift in a number of students in a certain grade and didn't have enough of a cohort to do a full remote teacher, you know, maybe we'd come up with a solution for a cross grade level thing, but it, the numbers are fairly close. So it doesn't seem like we're going to see any major shifts just based on the preliminary data, but we would have to tease that out a lot. And this data is getting shared out to the administrators, so they'll be looking through their own data um, with more specifics. But already, Dr. Slaney has already texted me to tell me that the current num numbers that I shared with you really do match up very well with their current model. Thank you. So if there were no more questions at the moment, what I was hoping to do you know, I, because I don't have all the answers and definitive dates, the one date I do have right now is that the commissioner has said April 5th for grades four, five, subject to change if he has different information tomorrow or over the weekend or beyond. But what I'd like to do is have, um, have the school committee vote on trying to bring all students back in K to 12 with four to five to be added on April 5th and TBD um, shortly thereafter for six to 12. If the, if the committee voted in favor of moving forward with our planning, then we would start planning not only with, we've already been starting with talks with administration, but then I would wanna move forward with a collaborative discussion with our union leaders and representatives and talk about some of the problems that maybe the people that are in the trenches doing this every day might have a real creative solution that we're not thinking of right now. So we wanna really have a collaborative approach. And I would start meeting with um, our members at K to five, um, a small group there with administration and union representatives and some tweak some of these things and if we can come up with an easy um, decision then we would draft an MOU together and bring it to the school committee and it may not require any impact bargaining. If we had some issues that we couldn't resolve then I would come back to you and start impact bargaining again. But I'm feeling positive and optimistic that we can make this work. So wait, Susan, can you just specify the vote again? That was, sorry, that was more mm -hmm. just specifically what you're asking us to vote on. Yes, I would ask you to vote for us to return K to five by April 5th, subject to more guidance from the state and subject to change related to that guidance. 
and for us to try to bring back six through 12 as soon as possible with dates to be determined as we roll out the plan. So forgive me, but because it's a vote, I think we have to be specific and accurate. So K to, K to three is already back. So what we're really recommending is bringing back four to five. Four to five mm -hmm. Sorry, right? I, yes, I, yeah, that's I thought okay. I said that. Sorry about that. That's grades, okay. grades four and five to return so, in, in person by April 5th. Okay, so that's one part of it. The six to 12, I mean, I mean to bring them back ASAP, I, I, I'm happy to, is that really what you're asking or, or you're asking for our support? I, that's a vague vote. Do you know what I'm saying? It is vague and I was hoping <laughs> I'd have more. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can do one of things. We can hold the vote, but I can still more, move forward with the planning with the union. It's really, I, I, don't, I just didn't want to move forward if the committee no, is not in favor of six to 12, because I do, I see it's, very, it's very likely that the mm -hmm. mandate is coming on grades four and five. So that's something we will have to do. But again, that's why I wanted you to see the data. The community okay. data is showing that by far and large, it's consistent about 80% grades K to 12 want to be in, in person. So I think mm -hmm. it's only fair to, to, to make that happen if we can. So um, Lisa and then Dawn. So, I'm wondering if there's the thing, the one thing that makes me nervous is the variants that are out there. I think we have plenty of information that schools are not super spreader hotspots based on what we're doing right now, based on the practices and protocols we have in place right now. But we're adding a whole bunch of more kids and we know there are variants out there that are more contagious. So what I'm wondering is if there's any way to tie in surveillance testing somehow to this return to school. Because I think that the one thing that makes me nervous is that we're gonna do this and then we're gonna have a big outbreak. And I just think that pool testing would be a really simple way to, you know, at least get a heads up before that happens, you know, at least have more data. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should require people to do it. I don't know. I would just like to discuss that more. I, I feel like we have to do, we have to be more serious about pool testing if we're going to put that many bodies that close together. Yeah. And that is, and that is the plan that I, I am really expecting and hoping, but as you, as you indicated, it's, it cannot be mandated. I think we have to keep encouraging and expecting, and I'm optimistic that with more people saying not sure and need more info, the more we can get into their hands. And, you know, I just showed you how much the data has already shifted in a short amount of time, just from one pool testing and all negative pools at yeah. Rams this week, we already have a larger number of people that have responded favorably that, that you can see the differences in that group. The numbers were quite different than what was at 54% was a, a significant difference. So, once people see, it takes away some of that fear. And, you know, we'll have another pool next week with uh, cohort B. I mm -hmm. also am working with Lynn to see when, when we could start the similar pool testing at Miller, because that would be the group coming back. So yeah. um, I think I mentioned last week that April 18th, we've been extended to for the, the DESE supported testing. So mm -hmm. I would want to have a plan in place tied in for Miller for that April 5th week as well uh, for that return date. So that is what's rolling out. It's going to be all tied to this work. But again, we can't mandate it, but we'll be strongly encouraging, recommending, and increasing that. And the more that it happens, the other districts that are doing it have said that the more it's happening, the more people are increasing their volume. And, and Desi has said that to us as well. Even mm -hmm. if it starts slow, it, it, it tends to increase. Yeah. And when you have a, if you have close contacts like that, then that's even more of a reason to do a pool test because that could get the close contacts back quicker if they're in that pool and we get a negative and then we're able to do, or we get one positive and we can do the antigen test. So we have two death, two testing resources at our fingertips right now mm -hmm. that we can use. So that will absolutely help counterbalance all of the things that you're concerned with, with the, uh, the shorter distances. So is there any way to, I don't know, I guess I, if we can't mandate it, I guess there's no real way to tie it into this vote. I, maybe what I'm asking for then is just a commitment that we will start a 
very emphatic communication effort to promote pool testing. And, and what I mean by that is not, I know you've been mentioning a newsletter, you know, in, in your end of the week update and, and that sort of thing. But I think we, we need to go a step further, maybe send out a couple of communications that talk about nothing other than pool testing and link to some of the good resources that are out there. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence that this is an important part mm -hmm. of getting kids back safely. And I feel really strongly about it because of the variants that are out there. If, if we didn't have the variants out there, I don't think I'd be nearly as nervous about bringing so many kids back in person. But because of the variants, I feel like we need to be extra cautious about this. So I guess I'm just asking for a commitment that we will do some very explicit communication around um, the pros of pool testing. And Lisa, I just want to add that I I would encourage you to set up a call with Catherine. She and I had a little science tete-a-tete -tete the other day for 45 minutes, and we talked exactly about this. So um, I would certainly encourage you to talk to her because I think um, it, it might ease a little bit of your fears, especially about the variants. And I don't, I'm not going to put her on the spot right now because she's probably not prepared, but I really do think that you should set up a call with her because um, I think there's some <clears throat> good information. You know, we had a really good um, little education class the other day, if you will, she and I. Dawn and then Cynthia. So in terms of, um, you know, I'm in support of, of your um, advising that we move forward with bringing four and five back in person by April 5th. But I would like you to move forward with a way to um, still have cameras to include kids if they're sick or if they become close contacts as we roll this out. So I don't know if that could be part of it. In addition, the TBD, on 6 through 12, is there any way um, at our next meeting by March 18th that we could have a more certain update um, on that TBD? Meaning after April 5th comes the week of April 12th and then we're uh, out for April vacation. I am incredibly concerned with even some of those seniors, like Ann Louise said, that will be gone by the third week, after the third week in May. And so we're we're kind of crunching, crunching, crunching the time that they would have that five-day opportunity. Interestingly, many of them, that 16, 17, and 18-year-old students may even come back vaccinated by May. Um, so those do seem like a, a, a group that should be high priority. So in terms of the TBD, um, I just don't wanna leave it too open-ended. If we could get an update on dates, and I know this is tough, but I know the commissioners, um, you know, we're, we're getting more information tomorrow and next week. But if we could advise people on March 18th, we really might be just giving them three weeks notice before a change or four weeks notice before a change. Um, so with an open TBD, I would really look for more information on more definitive dates by March 18th. Yeah, that, that would be my plan, Dawn, because... And that's why I said we don't even have to officially vote if I can move forward with the communication, but I would feel better that I have your support to really push strongly to get K to 12 back because that really is important. I mean, it's, it comes back to, I always said, equality does not allow us to have every child back right now. And that's why the remote platform makes sense, right? Moving to a shorter distance, we can get a lot more students in. 80% is significant that all grade levels are showing very similar numbers. So. I can't ignore that. We, we can't ignore that. So to have a collective effort of, of doing our best and putting forth a, a plan that will work as soon as I can get that. And yes, we, we've had those conversations. I even have some some preliminary dates in mind, but I don't want to do that without having more conversation because it's just happening so fast. Cynthia? Uh, thanks. I, I'm wondering whether there's any appetite about trying to do like a town hall for like the community, for the HPS community to talk specifically, you know, for an hour, even if it's about that, just talking about pool testing and the importance of pool testing, how it gets done, how it gets done, um, that it's, you know, shallow nasal, all that stuff. And then talk about uh, the importance of mask wearing and fit and have like Lynn do the whole display. And if we just focus on that and let them know what the plans are as we're moving forward, because I know you're meeting with the, um, the commissioner 
and we're going to have more guidance. I just, I feel like we just focus on this one thing to let people know that this is where we're moving for in April. I just, I don't know if there's any appetite to do that or whether it's uh, just something we can do as part of our own school committee meeting. But I just, I think it needs to be broadcast out more, like just to be focused on, just like we did when we brought students back to school, when we had the whole back to school plan, that we do something similar to that. I don't know if there's any, even any time for it, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Well, I will absolutely talk to Lynn, but I wouldn't want to put anyone on the spot I can tell you that um, our, our nurse Olson at and, and um, uh, Kim Bida, the two nurses at the middle school, did do a little video that they shared out to staff and students. So I, I think there is some appetite to do some things like that. I just wouldn't want to put anyone on the spot right now without giving them an opportunity what that would look like mm -hmm. and what their comfort level would be. But I, and it may not even be our staff. Maybe it's a, someone from Ginkgo to come in. You know, that's our that's the representative. So I'm open to exploring that some more and seeing what we can do with it. Catherine? And then Andy, sorry. I was actually gonna say exactly that. Like I bet Gingo or there's there's gotta be a video someplace. <laughs> I'm not sure about having a, a town hall just because I think people are kind of zoomed out and maybe won't wanna come to another meeting to hear more. But I do think that there's other ways to get that, that information out, um, especially when it comes to that, you know, the pool testing doesn't hurt, why it's important, what we use it for. Um, and that I think videos can be a really, um, a really important and easy, easily access access way to do that. Um, there's also ways to add levity to these things too, so that everything doesn't have to be quite so serious and, um, you know, and, and harsh sometimes. Um, but but I think that that's a, um, I, I like the idea of having all this information out there. I think it's really, really important, but I think it needs to be in a way that people can get to it when they're ready to get to it. I don't know about having like a, a meeting, but I, I agree, Cynthia, we need to get it out there. But I like the exactly what I was going to what you said, Susan, little short videos, or maybe there's already stuff out there. We don't even have to recreate the wheel. No, there actually is. And I, I sent out one of the videos, which was from Salem Public Schools that um, was linked in our end of the week update a couple of times now. There's a cute little video from, Ginkgo of a second grader. And I don't know if I sent this one out yet. That's one I was thinking of sending, particularly if we start with the younger children. But at the end of the video, the little boy, he says, and then you take your, and then you take, put your boogers downwards into the container. And I just thought if that's not, you know, a second grade vocabulary and it just shows you how, and he, and he giggled. And it was, it was, an, it was a real video of a real child. It was, it was adorable. So if that second grader can do that, so easily and comfortably and joke about it. I think we can handle this. So that video, I, I can send that one out tomorrow, but I, I mean, we need to come up with another plan to get some of those resources on the website as well. Yeah. Well, maybe we, we can do it too is the, with the communications, communications committee. Like we could put together, as Lisa just said, like a one of our newsletters could be just about this, you know, why it's important and how it's useful and, you know. Yeah, uh, why, why don't why don't you, one of you reach out to me because then I can pull together a lot of the stuff I have and let you kind of go through it all and pick what you think would be useful. Okay. All right. Andy, then Anne Louise. First of all, I think going, uh, leading with the boogers is a good idea. They're never not going to be funny. So <laughs> that's, that's a winner. Um, I agree that the pool testing really needs to be pushed and in place and really kind of at the forefront of this. Um, and then the other thing is, um, Oh, shoot, where was it? Um, <laughs> I've been waiting for so long. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I agree. I think that we need to, um, to look at getting back as many of these kids as quickly as possible. But it, I'm assuming that what you're asking us for tonight, just to be clear, is permission to start the planning and conversations around this. And then we're going to have a plan put in front of us before we roll this out. So yes. we're going to see the details before we before we say, yep, we're, we're ready to go on this. Is that correct? Yes. Um, okay. Just to be clear, though, the grade four or five if it's a mandate by April 5th, so I, by April 18th, we would be able to give you very specific information. I do want to caution that it's not going to be like our reopening plan, which was what, 40 pages or something. You will get yeah. something that would take our current schedule and what we would have to alter in order to make this change happen. Right. We have a lot of good systems in place, so it's just a matter of kind of scaling those up for more kids. Perfect. Thank you. Dan Louise? Um, yeah, so I, I second... What Andy said, start with the boogers, the, the videos, engaging content is a great way to go with this because I think some, I think a little bit of this is just the unknown. And I think we also have to accept that it's going to take a little bit of time for people to wrap their heads around what this is. I, I'm sure every one of us can remember our first COVID test 
drive to CVS or a center or whatever it is. Um, and the first time you went through it, it's, it's it was like weird and uncomfortable. And what are you doing? And then I, I probably have five of these things now. I don't know since, you know, last year. So um, I think people will get over the hump and it's just a matter of sharing information. And once your friend and your neighbor does it, you're going to be more comfortable with it and the kids will be the same. So I think it will come, but getting that information out there is important. Um, I'm comfortable doing a vote tonight on the grades four and five, because that's what's different, that's specific for April 5th. And then I think what, I, I guess what I would recommend is, I don't know what we're voting for grades six to 12, but if you're just looking for, um, you know, all in favor of developing the plan to do this as soon as possible, that I think is a specific vote. Just This is just pure procedural matter. I think that we could give you a, a vote on. Um, yes, that that's really what I was looking for is just okay. that, that that we are moving forward with the planning and collaboration with our HFT because we want it, we need to have your support in order to start having those conversations related to 6 to 12 as well. Okay, so we could put a motion to um, have Dr. Kuska put the um, time and resources into developing a plan to get our grades 6 to 12 back as soon as possible, and the final decision will be submitted to the committee as a separate vote when you have that plan. Okay. So the first so the first vote is it is simple as saying is the motion as simple as saying that um, there's a motion to eliminate the hybrid model for grades four through five as instructed required. By, <laughs> as required by the yeah. Department of Ed um, by April 5th. I think it would just word that as bring our grades four to five back full time as mandated by instead of eliminate the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, isn't I mean, it more clear? Though, word Lane, but isn't it more clear? There's not going to be a hybrid model. No, no. I think what we're voting, Stacy. Forgive me. I'm not trying to correct you, but we're not voting to eliminate something and then nobody goes to school anymore. I, and I'm just drawing out that logical conclusion. We're, we're voting to bring back these students full time to school. The implication is we get rid of the hybrid model, but what we're voting to do is bring them back full time. That's what the state's asking us to do. So I think it has to be worded that way. I'm not a legal expert, so someone make the motion. I'm I'm happy to. I understand where we're trying to go with it. So, moved by I, Cynthia. Well, who did, make the motion there, Mrs. Lestevnik, please. Uh, um, move to uh, move to bring our fourth and fifth grade students into uh, back into the classroom full time, but we're also then removing hybrid model. We're doing both. <laughs> So, as by mandated, April, by, as mandated wait, by the state. By April 5th. By April 5th. <laughs> that's, that's the key. You, you're, you're not necessarily bringing all, sorry to interrupt, but you're not necessarily bringing all students back. You're right. Who are yeah. remote or may stay remote. So you, I, you're right. Yeah, I'm just going to say, okay. Okay, that's, why, that's why we are really removing the hybrid so that people can come back full time. It's right. in, in, to be moving, yeah, I think you might need it for that reason to, to remove the hybrid model in. And be bring back by and to bring, only, yeah, yes. and bring back in person, full in person, and a small percentage remote. But I think if we leave it as as mandated by the Commissioner of Education and not say the date, even though that is the date he gave us, and that okay. way the date changes without a date. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So can we strike that motion on the floor or just not second it? Right. Keys really just for how does that work? Revise it. First, you didn't have a second, so you have nothing. So okay, fine. Okay, Cynthia, go for it again. Okay, um, I have motion to bring. Sorry. Now, what am I saying now? <laughs> <laughs> Remove. Are we removing? Eliminate no. the high eliminating model grades okay. four and five. All right. Motion to eliminate the hybrid model at grades four and five at the Miller School uh, to bring those those classes fully in person with remaining a remote option. No date. Is that okay? 
as mandated by the commissioner as mandated, that, as mandated by the commissioner of education for the, for the commonwealth of massachusetts oh my god stop keith you all get what i mean we all know what we're trying to say <laughs> can i have a second second <laughs> by ann louise okay moved by cynthia seconded by ann louise all in favor mr morton yes uh ms koshin yes mrs lestevnik yes Ms. Hanstead? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Um, Mrs. Raffi? Yes. That carries. Okay, so do you want the vote or do you just want the thumbs up right now, Susan, to move forward with planning? You know, I mean, the vote is more of a formality. I think that it's very clear what the intent is here. And I do feel comfortable that we can move forward and start collaborative planning with our HFT leadership as well. And then hopefully come back to you with us somewhat of a plan for March 18. Uh, Susan, can I just ask um, in your discussion tomorrow with the commissioner, is there going to be some discussion about how we're going to get our teachers vaccinated? Whether there's any collaborative effort to do that in any way? Um, I will not be in the meeting with the commission tomorrow. Okay. He's meeting the Board of Ed. I do okay, believe okay. that people can attend that meeting. It's I, I'm not, unfortunately, available at that time from 2 to 4. But public comment can take place. He's limiting it. Um, there's a link on the website to to the agenda. So, um, you know, you can. there is a potential to, I believe, attend that meeting um, and hear okay. some of those comments. It'd probably be similar to what we do here with a, a, a live feed that you're looking at. Right. Okay. Well, teachers are eligible as of March 11th, but CVS right. is also doing appointments already. Like you can yeah, get an so, appointment with them right now. So I mean, if, if they're done, available. <laughs> if if we're done with the conversation, I can I can go on to that a little bit. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So, um, yeah, as you, as you saw, as we all saw yesterday, we found out early in the morning. I think uh, superintendents were texting me at 6 a.m. to say, "Look at this, CVS is coming out," and then. Uh, some of you were sharing information. All of us had that information coming out. People were seeing it on the CVS website that K-12 educators were now able to get the vaccine through CVS. And that is related to the federal government supporting that throughout the country. And then we heard the commissioner speak yesterday, and he is opening up the vaccinations for March 11th for all other sites in Massachusetts, which is great news. We've been hoping and trying and still not giving up on a collaborative effort. A number of towns uh, surrounding us, a larger group of towns, had put forth a motion to the Department of Public Health and the governor and Representative Dykeman's office had been working with us. That's still out there. Um, they were meeting on that. I can't say that that will be successful because it looks like the governor has made his decisions, but we are still trying anything we can. So our staff today, we were already... Oh, <laughs> yeah. Susan, you Susan, you froze for a little bit. No, we missed the last part. We were talking you said about our staff today, and then yes. you froze. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, if I lose, if you lose me, Keith can jump in because he knows what I'm saying. Um, okay. So yes, a number of staff today were able to already acquire appointments for their first oh, vaccination. Good. That's great. Through CVS. And then the other piece to that that we're working on, Lynn Bowler, as you know, my guru, uh, right away had been working with, she's called some of our local Walgreens and places to see if they're going to be able to do any uh, vaccinations as well. There is an appetite for that. Um, there's a, a desire to help us with that. If they get, you know, even 100 doses and we could kind of prioritize an offer to people, there's a willingness. So if that happens, we'll jump on it. Um, working on every and all possibilities at this point and trying to support staff to get the vaccinations as soon as possible. So yes, it would have been nice if the commissioner could have moved the staff up sooner in, in collaboration in conjunction with these plannings. It's a little frustrating, but it's all going to work out. Dawn? When you said you uh, have reached out to Walgreens and if they could get 100, uh, are, you, are you thinking like a drive-through vaccination clinic similar to what you did through Walgreens in the fall for the flu vaccine or a specific Walgreens that staff would go to? I don't want to give false hope, but I, just from my conversation with Lynn, that I think that's what she's shooting for. She was, you know, 
it, it's not likely that we would be able to get the larger numbers of staff vaccinated, but even if we could get something like that and get a, a group of staff, that would be really useful. And uh, also with CVS, I know that um, our Board of Health, our Director of Health is also trying to have that conversation, but preliminarily, if they were able to do something, they were talking into April and May, and I think May would definitely be too late early April into mid April, you know, the vacation week, that might be helpful. But in the meantime, I just, I don't know how many would be left by May. So I don't want to, you know, overcommit us to something if it's not viable, because our nurses would have to help with that, which they're willing to, but the sooner we could do that, the better as well. So we've got multiple things going on and not giving up on all of this. And from my preliminary data that I sent out to staff, it looks like about 25% of our staff have started the vaccination process. So so more than I thought, you know, because we've had, there are behavioral health specialists, there, there are various categories that staff would have fulfilled in other areas. So they've been able to get it through legitimate ways for other reasons. So it's been great. So it's moving, it's happening. Good. Any questions on vaccination at this point? And again, Susan, you know that we will write letters to the state, like what, whatever you need us to do to help support, you know, we're, we're behind you trying to help with the vaccinating of, of, of our, our staff. Yeah, I totally, I totally know that. And, you know, we, the letters have gone out from us as well. And I, as I think I mentioned last week, the representative Dykeman's office and uh, Senator Spooker's office, they've been very supportive. And I mean, I think two, two or three times they've reached out to me to hear more and ask more questions. So I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, it, it doesn't mean that they can make things change, but they are definitely putting in their best effort as well. So, you know, I think the more we hear and the more people um, advocate, it's, at the end of the day, it's up to the governor to release those vaccinations. Yeah. That's the final step. Yeah. Dawn? Um, I don't know if this would be possible, but if you are engaged in conversations with Walgreens about a potential drive-through with as many as 100 vaccinations for staff, would it also be a time to discuss with them, and obviously they're not eligible yet, but if we are anticipating that students 16, 17, and 18 are going to be eligible, um, maybe even as early as May or early June, we may have 600 or more students that could be eligible. Maybe even a th if only a third of them took us up on it, we might be able to have a student um, drive-through vaccination clinic too with Walgreens if they had an interest in coming back. So maybe just as something to discuss with them if we're discussing a staff um, vaccination clinic. And I don't, as I mentioned, I don't like to speak for people that aren't present and, and commit them to things, but. I do know how committed our nurses are, and I really feel confident that if that were a possibility, that they could help with it. I, I'm pretty certain that they would do that. And I guess I just I just want to reiterate to a in case people don't know or understand it, it's not um, the town's fault. It's not. It's the way the state is managing the releasing of vaccines. It's not that Pulse and Public Schools isn't trying. It's it's there is no vaccine to be had because they're not being released to us. So I just want people to understand that, um, you know, as a reminder. Do you have more on your COVID update? I have one more okay. quick update and something that we'll be continuing to talk about. Um, as our seniors mentioned earlier, fall to sports is up and running. And we'll be starting to have games uh, very recent. And as I, I think we have some games on March 19th. I think there is a swim meet this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. But please don't quote me on that because I've been far more involved in pool testing, vaccination, and all the other things that you wouldn't normally do as a superintendent. So that has distracted me from getting all these dates and times together. But with that, we did meet our, our team that's a meeting regularly at the district and high school level to talk about the MIA regulations and all the changes with sports met to determine what we believe our next steps are for fall two sports happening. As I mentioned, they are rolled out already. Um, the state, I mean, I'm sorry, the community is in our, is in the yellow range. So would this be week six, I think, as, as of now. So that's great progress that we've been remaining in the yellow. However, um, our emergency management director, Chief Cassidy, did let us know that be cautious because there's been an an increase since last week, and I would potentially connect that to February vacation and some of the traveling that may have happened. So although the numbers are still good, 
there definitely has been an increase in, in the last week or so. And typically what we've seen is after the last vacation, it was um, a couple of weeks later that we started to see some changes. So he is being very cautious that we did see a spike since the February vacation. And even though we're in the yellow, we really do have to keep our mitigation strategies in place and be vigilant and cautious. So given where we are, we are recommending that for outside sports, which we right now is football, we will be allowing two adult spectators for the home team only outside, which is consistent with what we did in the fall for other sports that were outside. Because our other sports are indoors and in our field house on the home games, we are not allowing um, spectators in indoor facilities, and that is consistent right now with Ashland. And right now, Milford and Millis have not committed to its TBD for some of the other towns in our Tri-Valley League. So we'll be hearing from those schools as well. So the reason we feel we need to stick with it is because not only with that, that spike that is, is starting to happen again, we have classes at the field house. And quite honestly, we have not, as we've talked about before, we have not allowed anyone on campus in our schools, our academic programs for any reason if you're not a staff member or a student, we did have some volunteers that were able to commit for an extended period, well over a month, and we were able to utilize their supports, but we have not had daily volunteers in any way, shape or form. And that has allowed us to be as successful as we have been. And that has allowed us to feel positive that we can bring our students back in person, but it's not a reason to let down our guard and change how we're doing things. So for right now, we are looking to monitor the data and see where we go over the next few weeks and not have indoor spectators. However, we are not making that decision for the entire season. We are going to continue to see how things go over the next weeks and see if we can modify that recommendation. You know, that could go either way. We hopefully we won't go into a more positive rate and turn red. That would certainly change our decision at that point. So a decision could change one way or the other. But for now, we feel very we feel very intentional about being cautious and it would be hard for me to open up for visitors at our field house, which is an academic building as well, and still be not allowing visitors at other buildings and we do not feel safe to do so at this time. So I just wanted to give that update, but I don't want parents to feel like we've made a final decision. It is where we are right now and when I come back and see what happens over the next few weeks, we will continue to meet as a district team and see if there are any changes we can make at that time. Cynthia, then Don. Um, I just wanted to wondered if you could also just give an update about um, indoor uh, singing at the, the choral groups and things like that, because I know that was something that there's been a shift in this week. Yes, so. thank you, I will. Uh, before I do that, I, I did want to forget one thing. Um, I did talk to our director of athletics to see if can we offer volleyball or um, track outside? And mm -hmm. well, that is not what we normally do for that, that season, we are going to look into that. It, Keith, uh, be prepared that he'll be coming to you for some suggestions that I had today, and I'm not promising, an, promising anything, but if we can do um, track outside, barring the weather and the snow that's still there, obviously it may not happen right now, but I'm definitely, interested in seeing if we can move it outdoors as well as volleyball and that would require some other um, resources so I can't promise it but I, I just want you to know that we're willing to explore all avenues if it means because then if it's outdoors then we could allow the two adult spectators. Um, Dawn is it about sports before I move on to music? Okay. <laughs> yes <laughs> so and, and thank you Susan because that was in part what I was going to bring up because I remember when Matt Baker came to us back in December about indoor track part of it was if we move it to fall two we have an outdoor track so that is exactly what I was hoping for because we were we are now I think it is as early as March 16th um, or March 13th you're going to have something like 50 or 60 um, female and male track athletes competing inside when we have an outdoor track um, the one thing I would say we have a track there was snow I know the snow is melting but we also moved the snow that was on the football field onto the track 
creating three, four foot mounds, oh. which are now, you know, we've created it and now it ha it's going to take longer to melt. So to the degree there's any way to remove some of that and then have that available for our 50 to 60 track athletes to be able to participate outside um, I, I think that's really important, or even even more so if we get one of one of you know sometimes we get a number of snows in March to just maybe consider not removing it and putting it on the track. Wait, poor Keith. I just have to say this. I think he was out there personally snow blowing. Like it was such a big deal getting the snow off the field. I know. Keith so I think they were giving me daggers now. I just right. I like I think they were hoping it would melt. So in fairness, like that was an unintended consequence. Right. And honestly, let's let's hope. I mean, if we get, we're, we're looking at some warmer weather. So not only melting, but if we get rain on a warmer day, often that washes away. So let's hope that over the next couple of weeks that will take care of itself. Legitimate concern, though, Don. <laughs> Don, okay. just, so, just so you know the thought process, I mean, football has to happen outside. There is not an option. Um, we do have an indoor track. And so when, when, when making that decision to move the snow there, that's the only place we could move it because we can't run any of the equipment that was doing it across the track or you wouldn't have a track at all. Um, it's actually something that happened to Ashland a couple of years ago when they removed snow from their football field and they ended up having to redo their track. Um, so again, we, we, we know it's there, it's been melting. It's, it actually didn't look too bad today when I went out, surprisingly. So, um, you know, after this weekend, it really does warm up next week. So we actually have a, a good little stretch possibly coming, so. Yeah, but you know, I like to think of the glass as half full and not half empty. Um, some towns did not offer and voted to not have any winter sports, and we were able to pull that off. So while we did not have spectators, and I know people were disappointed, I um, heard that there were some wonderful comments from our hockey um, athletes about their experience, about the, the things that they missed were, I think the things that they've gained by being able to play far outweigh that. So I, I feel like the kids are going to make the best of it as disappointing as it is. And again, it is temporary right now, not ruling it out as a possibility, but definitely open to if there's ability to do it outside, we will make that happen as well. And that will allow us to have spectators in that fashion. So um, glass is half full and it could only get better. I agree. And I just, just especially as it melts, really looking at whether there are other areas to put it other than the track. I absolutely agree. Um, and I also think, um, you know, it's not just about the spectators. It's the idea that you could have those 50 to 60 athletes competing outside and then the 50 or 60 from whatever other school we're competing against too. Yes. Maybe you can make snow removal part of the cardio workout for the athletes. Give everybody a shovel, go outside and move the snow. You don't Catherine, want the shoveling the on that. Team, no, you don't. The tennis team has done that more years than you can count down I'm at not the joking. Park. That was yeah, not They've best. been out there with the shovels. <laughs> Please, we can't have shovels no. on the track. I, I, no. We won't have a track. It is a, it is a surface that is, is, is a soft surface. It is not yes, empty. Funny, no, right. Right. We can't do I don't that. want to encourage that anywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, that would have, we, would, we would have done that. And then the last thing, thank you for reminding me, Cynthia, was that we heard, was it just this week? The days are blurring together, but we found out that they have now offered, they're now able to offer indoor music classes at 10 feet with masks on. So we've already talked about that, and I know our high school music team is ready to go and very excited about what we can do either in the auditorium or in some of our larger rooms. We will make this happen, and yes, they will wear masks, but I think it's better than the alternative, and the kids will be happy to do so. So that's another exciting piece that I couldn't understand why we could do phys ed and, um, and have instruments but not have chorus. Again, with masks on, that makes sense to me. So good news on that platform as well. Great. Thank you for that. Peter, were you going to say something? I saw you on mute. I did, yeah, I just wanted to thank Max and Nicole, uh, who had written numerous times to the state. I also wrote it several times. And, and we were very help, happy that this uh, change was made because we knew we could do it safely with distance. So it's great. Yes, and Max has been, I mean, you've seen me share out the videos that they've been working on with the high school students. The kids have made the best of it, but this is great to have that opportunity. So thank you to all of our music staff and all those efforts, Peter. 
So are there any other questions? Um, Cause I'm, I'm not trying to rush you, but Anne Louise needs to get off at nine. And so I, I'd like to, um, Oh no. <laughs> I'd like to just move 18 minutes budget. or so lady. <laughs> budget. <laughs> Just a tiny little thing called budget. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we can do it, but if anyone does have more questions on the COVID stuff, then by all means. There's no major changes though, right? Like, so it's all, it's the same as we were looking at last week, right? Oh, wait, are there any other questions Sorry. on COVID? Or I don't want to just shift nope. the topic. Sorry. No, I thought we were moving. Okay. Um, so budget. Um so the budget subcommittee, I'm trying to remember it since last week. I felt like we met twice, but it wasn't twice since last week. Um, we met and discussed at length uh, Dr. Kuska's recommendation. Just to bring us back another week or two, when Dr. Kuska initially presented it, there were a few concerns um, raised by the committee at large and, and the subcommittee. Um, or, or questions, I should say. Um, so let's just start by acknowledging that, that the request was done very thoughtfully by the administration uh, with Dr. Kuska's guidance to try to strike a balance between, um, you know, being thoughtful, focusing on the most urgent needs, um, and at the same time, not, you know, not, um, not going beyond those this year because there are so many other key considerations that we're dealing with. And it's a highly complex budget environment. We've got this year that we're still trying to finalize the costs for um, because there are unusual costs related to COVID. Um, we've got the upcoming budget year. We've got our own operating budget and, you know, what we, um, can expect or would hope to be appropriated by the town, but then we've got these other external resources um, in stimulus funding, be it the CARES money or the potential round two Biden stimulus money coming for next year, and, and trying to figure out how all this fits together and what should be, could be covered by one versus the other, et cetera, makes this a, a bit of a challenging exercise. That said, um, when we first looked at the request, there were a couple of areas that we raised concerns about. One was around the social and emotional support uh, sort of category, and in particular up at the high school, we had raised a question about why the coordinator um, that Dr. Kuska proposed was only a half-time FTE, um, and Dr. Kuska took a closer look and um, I th think really, if I may paraphrase what you were doing, is you were trying to be conservative and thoughtful in how you implemented that position, but in an ideal world, it's a full-time position to really get the bang for the buck. That role needs to be a full-time role. So um, she adjusted the role to a full-time role at our last meeting. In addition to that, Dr. Kuska fleshed out the job description I don't have it in front of me because I'm staring at all of you. That was apparently a mistake um, for the social justice and equity and, and um, SEL director. And um, I think that's really important that we have that job description. I'm not going to read through that tonight. I hope you all have it handy. And if you do not, we will get it to you ASAP. But it helps us understand better the focus of that particular role, the responsibilities, how that individual will engage, um, you know, across the district, um, not only in curriculum planning, but training, et cetera. So um, it's a complicated role and we, we, we were optimistic, but maybe question whether you're going to find one person who embodies those two skill sets. And that was a big part of our discussion in the budget subcommittee. Um, and I'll, I guess I'd let you talk to that quickly, Susan, if you'd like to address that concern and what we kind of came up with as a um, sort of, if you, if you run into challenges with that. Yeah, I think just because um, originally we we're really focusing on what the COVID needs are for next year versus trying to think long term because we wanted the strategic planning to consider other other change we might might make in the future. But given that we would try to find a 1.0 person and I do think there are people that do have that inclusive equity 
um, social justice piece, I feel like the social emotional piece is very much intertwined in that because I think a lot of the things that we're dealing with with equity, helping to support students with inclusive environments leads to a dissipation of some of that social emotional need. So I think they do, they are intertwined, but you're right, a social emotional person may have more of a social work um, adjustment counselor background and an equity person could have various um, walks of life and, and practical experience as well. But I do think that there could be a person that could fit both molds if they're intertwining the social emotional needs under the inclusive equity and social justice needs. If we could not find the um, exact position, you know, potentially we would modify that. I do think that although I definitely want to spend time and Dr. Battello has been working as we talked about tonight with Diverse Holliston, we are definitely going to increase our training and put together a long-term plan for working on equity and anti-racist work in the district. And that's what this person would be helping us with as well. But next year, we know that we're gonna have a large need for developing some intervention models for trauma and SEL for tier two and tier three and some small group instruction. And, and then we wanna do something that would be aligned vertically K to 12. So that really is gonna take up a lot of time for next year. And I think that would be the focus of doing a lot of auditing and working with our staff and developing intervention plans and doing training for our staff. Thank you. Thank you for giving that highlight. Um, the other position that we've, we've talked a lot about um, in the subcommittee was the psychologist um, for different reasons. One was, you know, if, if we think we're going to need it, we're going to need it now, you know, it's not a question of will we need it more later. It's it, I think the reality is having that position sooner rather than later is probably um, probably a fair statement. But at the same time, you, you know, we, we went back and forth on what that person would be able to do, especially in the near term. And on the positive side, having another psychologist in the system would simply add capacity. Um, I think there has been a little bit of a misunderstanding, at least historically, with respect to this role that they are only supposed to do um, testing and assessment related to IEPs, et cetera. And that isn't the case. The, the reality is that that's all they've been able to do because we just haven't had enough of them. Um, and and that's, that's a tough reality. Um, but our challenge now is that we need more hands-on direct counseling support for our students. And I, I would go as far as to say that's not a new need, but I think the need is exacerbated by the pandemic more than ever. And so, you know, on the one hand, I would give anything. I think Lisa um, and Andy, we, we talked about this at length, like the idea that there could potentially be enough resources to pull that psychologists into this year's budget ask um, because right now it's it's on the FY23 ask. Um, having said that, I'm not sure it solves enough of the problem and here's why. Um, our students don't compartmentalize their needs to the school day. It's when they go at home, go home at night, it's their weekends, if they're feeling isolated or stressed or anxiety whether it's related to the pandemic or anything else, um, you know, those, those challenges manifest themselves 24 seven and we can't necessarily um, adequately support them around the clock, right? And especially not with one body. So we began putting some thought into um, another potential solution that is more of a, um, and, and I'm gonna introduce this on a, very preliminary level because the idea is not fully vetted, but um, it's garnering some support. Um, but the idea would be that we might be able to partner at a community level, work with um, youth and family services, set up more of um, a model where we have an intake coordinator potentially um, outside the schools, but who the schools could contact immediately, and then that person could more readily assess the individual's challenge, and then potentially we'd have um, contracted access, if you will, to an outside provider 
uh, network of, of counselors, therapists, et cetera, so that we could close that gap between my child is, is struggling, what do I do? And right now the two answers are, here's a list of providers, start dialing around to see who you can get into and hope you can get into them before you know, the next three months is up. And on the other side of the equation, you know, there's sort of the urgent solution, which is you're taking them off to the hospital. And, you know, I think there are so many, there's, there's so much in between those two, you know, a student who needs more ready access to counseling and support can't wait three months, but may not need the extreme. So, I'm not sure exactly what this looks like. And in full deference to our director of student services, um, Kelly Camp, she, you know, she has not, she, she had a death in the family and um, this rightfully should really be something we sit at the table with her and talk to her about. Um, but in her absence, you know, we, we spoke with Keith, we spoke with Susan, we got some preliminary encouragement um, from uh, Ms. Hine, um, very preliminary. Like, and when I'm saying that, I mean, you know, conceptually, some sort of community-based model around this could work. It could support the schools and potentially other needs in the community. So I guess what I'm saying is that I just wanted to share this very initial idea with you. Um, certainly get some, some high-level reaction, but, but give us the time to sort it out and vet it with the subject matter experts, because that would not be me. I can spot the need. I know I, I have a very good sense of what I think this could look like, but it needs to be really developed and refined by the subject matter experts um, in the district and in the community. So that that's sort of one thing. And then what the point of this as it relates to budget is that I think it would mitigate our need to address the psychologist sooner than FY23. Potentially. Yeah, um, wait, can you just pause for one minute? Because yeah. Catherine had a question, like, uh, I just want <laughs> five, five minutes to go. No. Go for it, Catherine. <laughs> yes, yeah, go. It was actually just one point ago, but I'm, um, but it may be five minutes. I don't know. Um, but when you were talking about the, um, the full-time effort, possible social worker, or maybe someone who focuses more on diversity and comes from that angle, um, I know in terms of resources and just sort of um, having more hands to create curricula and align it across the district and things like that, I think there's a real opportunity to, um, and I've, I have talked to Dr. Kuska about this a very little bit, um, there's a real opportunity to engage students, specifically social work students, uh, masters in social work yeah. students. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of universities and, you know, that are, that are always looking for field placements. But in order to have a field placement, you have to have someone with an LICSW to supervise them. Catherine, right. we do have an intern. Right. We have social work interns from um, Boston College. But we could have more. We could, but we we do have it. We have a starting yeah. of a program is what I'm saying. So and yeah. in order to have, like you, you can only have, ask the social work social workers we have now to supervise so many students. So if, they, if there's a place in the budget to have another LICSW come on, and and I know from experience that the, you know, the curricula in, that's, that happened through the, you know, the National Association of Accreditation of Social Workers it has to have the diversity piece involved in it. So they are equipped to do that. And they can certainly, you know, you could have a group of interns that come in and focus on just that and but you have to have someone who can supervise them. So I would push for having someone who's a licensed clinical social worker coming in as opposed to someone who has a, you know, a master's degree in something different um, because we, they're much more multifaceted and much more useful in, in building those programs and building those relationships. So um, when you're saying coming in, you're saying coming into the schools? Well, no, when you were talking about the budget where there's a, like the, um, oh, the, the SC, live effort. The SCL, or the, just social right. justice person okay correct so if that person can be could be a licensed clinician and i mean like not as not a psychologist but a, but a licsw then we then open the door to having more interns that could do that social emotional work of helping to develop a curriculum because it's exactly the kind of thing that social work interns do and if they're in their second year of internships they actually do see 
they see clients. They they will talk to people one on one, but a lot of it, a lot of it can ha- can support the work that we're doing, and it's always you know every every year it's a new set of energy and a new set of hands and can really infuse a lot of energy into the district at the same time. And so, if I'm hearing you correctly, that that um, what you're addressing is a way to satisfy the SEL. Um, social justice and equity role with a licensed social worker, et cetera, or a clinician that has a, a master's student or even a doctorate, what have you, um, because that's essentially what they'd be doing. That, that sounds brilliant to me. I don't, that's a great suggestion. I don't know what Dr. Cusset, you want to respond to that? Hello, Susan. Yeah, Are you yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> it, it's likely that they, they would have that background. I mean, even now we have at, at the um, high school, we have two adjustment councils and the adjustment council role, they have to have a master's in social work to get the adjustment council license. And we also have a licensed so- social worker at the high school. And even some of our guidance counselors, um, I know at Miller, uh, I, I don't know all, I haven't looked at all, but I have looked and some of our guidance councils also have that designation and that, that certificate as well. So we have quite a few people. And I think certainly the director role to have that as well would even just enhance and add to that program and be able to support the staff in developing those interventions. Is that we, we were actually only on our second year of having an intern, I think this year with Gretchen at the, um, Gretchen Powers at the middle school. And uh, it took us like four years just to get the field placement from um, the Boston School of Social Work. So Boston College School of Social Work. So, but yeah, Susan, it would be great to add more. Susan, is this, um, forgive me because I don't recall, but do you have the licensing credentials in the job description? I'll pull it up. Um, I don't have it in front of me either. You don't have to do it right now. I just think it would be a good yeah, idea. I, 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 know, I don't exactly remember what I worded, but certainly if I didn't, I can add that for sure. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Catherine. Thank you. Um, I wasn't sure when you were first talking which, which of the two roles. Um, I think one of the challenges we have the challenge with the direct hands-on counseling is access and consistency for students right so getting access is really really hard right now um you kind of end up having to do it privately and it can take months and that's that's a a real hurdle um, I think for students who are struggling, it, it, it can impede their education because they just aren't functioning at a level that um, they could be or should be. And um, and then consistency is the other challenge. So, you know, that's where I, I know you weren't suggesting this per se, but I would be less inclined to use a student who was an intern or a master's student. That is a model that's, I think, very common at the university level. So you'll see the master's students coming in um, and supporting health centers at a university. Um, And it's great because it provides more staff, if you will, but it's not consistent semester to semester sometimes or year over year. And and there's just not enough bandwidth um, often. So I'm not sure if that's what you were thinking as well, but I, I'm well, I mean, sure I think, I think you're really talking, you're speaking to a specific type of student in need, and there are certainly very certainly people who need elongated relationships with a therapist, but there's also a real, you know, some, some kids are just in crisis and they need someone yes. now, and they need someone to t- walk with, work with them for a month and then yes. they sort yes. of move on. And so I think there's yeah. different levels in the sort of spectrum of, of, I don't, I well, don't that's what I'm it. talking about, though. That's exactly it. Is that kid in crisis who may not need something for six months, but can't even get somebody over the next 72 hours, you know? Sure. So I guess I guess what I'm saying is I'm not proposing the social work interns as the fix it for the kid who needs a more intensive plan over time, but that it would be more very, you know, experienced, trained people who are there in the moment, perhaps one semester at a time, that can be the supportive hands during a crisis. Well, oh, so, so I guess that's, that's definitely something to consider. And um, I guess where, I, where I'm leaving this is that after a lot of debate around how to address this particular challenge, I think what we've accomplished is that we've acknowledged the challenge. <laughs> 
<laughs> that um, and that the psychologist um, in the very short term might not even be the right solution for it. So rather than try to bring that position forward to this year, this is still a question mark. We're waiting for Kelly to get back, you know, in back from uh, her current situation, something to bet a little bit more carefully with her and um, some others. And then, you know, hopefully there'd be a more specific uh, proposal from Dr. Cuska um, and team that we can look at as um, as a committee and say this, this might be the ideal way to address it. Um, so for now, we're not gonna change what's in the budget related to this right now. That was our recommendation is to kind of, we almost put in a placeholder. I can't remember who on the subcommittee recommended putting in a placeholder, like a you know, certain amount of funding toward this, but we don't even know what that would be. So um, we're just suggesting um, that this is, this is a TBD. And so that's what that one item could change over the next three, three to four weeks as I, just saying is where we're at on this. Um, and maybe what you're suggesting might be another way to get around it and we can bring that into the model. I, I don't know what the answer is, but um, but I do think there's a need there and there's gotta be some way to address it. So um, so that was that. The, um, the other topic that took on um, some discussion was uh, any kind of mitigation or support um, that we could put in place related to language instruction. Um, it's an area that I think everyone has acknowledged there's um, definitely been some regression because how could there not be when the learning has been um, predominantly um, asynchronous and it's it's been challenging. Um, but um, the language, Dr. Kuska has been meeting with our language experts since our last meeting. There have been some very specific recommendations coming up um, from those departments. They're small, and that's the good news. <laughs> um, in fact, um, I think there are probably things that can be covered through the existing operating budget, but the good news is there are some recommendations about um, assessment programs to help understand where our students actually are at right now, how much they may have lost over this past, well, I'll go as far as saying the past year here. Um, and, you know, then from there, they can determine how to get back on track with language instruction. So I don't know if you want to say any more about that, either um, Dr. Patello or Dr. Kuska. I'll just quickly say that I, um, I talked with Dr. Patello today and asked him if he could work with um, K to 12, looking at the math tutor positions that we talked about, as well as the concerns with our language programs, French immersion and different places that are going to need different supports and obviously numeracy and literacy throughout pre-K to 12. And um, we, would, we, are, we are planning on putting together a presentation. It may not be extensive, but some, um, some information to kind of talk about the timeline of how we, how we might propose to assess and plan to address some of the learning gaps and we are at this point of tentatively putting it forward for the April 1st meeting. Um, it's just something we talked about today. So if April, as soon as April 1st or the meeting after. But I, I, I put that on Dr. Patello's shoulders because I know that is something that is in his wheelhouse and he will be able to support staff in just coming up with some dates and timeline for how we could assess those needs related to COVID or otherwise. Lisa. So I think and Louise, I think, was focused primarily on the language aspect. But Dr. Kuska, I think you're answering a, the other question that we discussed as well in budget subcommittee, which is um, mitigation of learning loss for the older kids. Because I, we got a question from um, a parent about the budget. The way it went out in the newsletter, it looked like you know the mitigation efforts. Um, for learning loss, we're focused at the elementary level because we're um, talking about tutors at Placentino and Miller. And so in budget subcommittee, we had asked about, you know, mitigating learning loss for, for older students. And Dr. Kuska can, you know, add more, but basically the, the short answer is that they're still assessing this, they, you know, they don't, 
it won't necessarily be additional money in the form of something like tutors because that's not really the model they would use at the high school for sure and and it's different at the middle school as well but we wanted to um just kind of put that caveat in there that there still could be some expenses around the mitigation of learning loss that have not yet been identified just because we're still trying to figure this all out. So um, I want to kind of just put an exclamation point on that because I think that um, that's something that was really important that we talked about in budget subcommittee that I feel like we're going to have to dig into a little bit deeper. But, you know, obviously this is a draft budget. You know, we vote a budget before we even have a, a public hearing. So we have a, a couple of other bites at the apple. Um, so this is just meant to represent the the budget picture that we have at this moment in time, it may look a little different in, you know, a month or six weeks. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, that's really important, Lisa. We did spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, and there was no specific addition that could have been made to have addressed the grade six through 12 um, loss of learning. So we're still waiting to hear. We talked about a lot of things, though, including, you know, summer programs, access to summer courses, even potentially reevaluating what counts for credit toward the high school graduation if students are able to find their own resources to address their own mitigation. Um, so, you know, th there was a lot of discussion put into that. Um, so thank you, Lisa. So I guess what that takes us is that from last week to this week, we did not recommend any changes. Where we came out is that the budget subcommittee is going to recommend that the committee at large vote to support Dr. Kuska's um, recommended budget at this point in time. And we can come back to the numbers and look at it for the motion. Um, with, I guess, the caveat that this could change slightly over the next few weeks, either because one of these things that we just talked about may come to light, there may be an opportunity or um, something that that we want to um, make sure is included in the request, or because we learned something new from um, the state level or, you know, from the federal stimulus money, we will, we will get a better picture on that. That could shift potentially how things are um, being resourced and paid for. Um, I'm not going to put a lot of emphasis on that because I don't know that that'll happen because what's in the pure operating budget is really not the COVID stuff. Um, some of it is, but, you know, I think we've still got a few weeks to see how that's going to pan out. But we are supposed to be presenting to the Finance Committee um, end of March. I think the date was the 23rd. Um, so we want to be able to go in there at least with a picture of where we stand um, and get a vote from the committee on um, Dr. Kuska's, uh, the last version of the budget, that would be our recommendation to have everybody support it. So, I, you know, I'm wondering if people, I think people need a little time to digest. Can we, um, our next meeting is the 18th. You know, would people be comfortable voting then? Because especially if things are going to change, even in the next week or two, you know, I, I just... No, I don't know. And, and uh, yes, we could vote on the 18th. I would be completely comfortable with that. I don't know if Lisa and Andy, would you feel fine? I, I mean, I think that's totally fine if you want to do that. I just think so much is moving. Like, I, I, I don't... You know. I almost feel silly voting tonight and then no we know there are some things that are potentially going to change why waste the vote like that's silly Who I, i'm absolutely comfortable with that stacy i mean honestly that's why you're not looking at a presentation from me tonight because normally you know i'd have a nice neat presentation here's where we're at la 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 and this year is just so unusual i mean we know what the number is right now um, and, you know, just in case any of our finance committee or select board or town administrator uh, colleagues are watching, this is not because it's all wishy-washy and we're going to be adding lots. That's not what this is. It's just there's some nuances to this that I think could change over the next three weeks. So, um, but, we, but we are going to need, you know, we're on a timeline heading into when the warrant needs to be published and they need to shape the town budget. Um, so and we do need to be cognizant of that, but we could wait to the 18th. 
Absolutely. And so when are you meeting? So what I want is to afford the committee questions tonight, obviously, but if there are more specific questions, if they can send them to you by a certain date, so that you can discuss in your next, are you, so my question is, are you having a subcommittee meeting before the 18th? I believe so. I'm going to look at what Yeah, day we're meeting day. every Wednesday yeah. at this point. Yeah. Okay. So every I would, rec so my recommendation to the committee is read through the budget as presented again. And any questions, send it to the budget subcommittee so that they can discuss on Wednesday. And then the answers they can provide to us on the 18th and then we'll be more informed to make a vote. That's my recommendation. I just, um, I, we will take questions tonight. I'm not, I'm not saying no questions tonight, but I just, I, I think people need to really digest all of this and just things keep changing that, you know, Lisa, I don't want to just. Did you want to say something relevant to the, Lisa, you looks like you're having your hand up, sorry. Oh no, I was just going to say, you know, I think, just this is this is a really tricky budget year because we're you know trying to plan for things we've never had to think about before like learning loss and mm -hmm. you know we just want to be able to i i think we've just kind of we've discussed some things that we haven't normally had to really dig into so i appreciate you know the your patience on on some of this stuff yeah and at some point in the future we are probably going to have to look at if we don't get all the money we ask for. How are we gonna how are we gonna manage that situation? So yeah, let's, yeah. let's not discuss that process just yet, but I think that's a reality that we have to probably at some point face is if the, we don't get every cent that we need, what are what are our options? So but that'll that'll be down the road after we vote the yeah. budget and find out we can't cut every penny. Or or we may find out that there's more money available from round two, I don't know. This team is like, yeah. I, mean, I think that's, we just don't know right now. There's quickly. so many unknowns, even more than usual. So I just wanted to confirm the the presentation that we have from Susan from a couple of weeks ago is still what we're working on right now. There's nothing new that you have for coming from the budget subcommittee. Well, I think that we should be having that we're putting up for the community to see, or is it just Dr. Just Cox's? make sure, well, there will be, there will be. Right, but right, as but of right now, I'm just trying as to- As of right now, I think it's the one from last Thursday, not two weeks ago, because there was okay. that adjustment in the 0.5 to one full. Right, FTP. that was just last week. You're yeah, right. with, with the narrative that sheet that has the uh, monetary yeah. estimates as well as yes, the job. Yes, I have it. Up. I have it up. I just yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can always look at the newsletter <laughs> for a handy summary of yeah. the uh, priority needs. I did that absolutely, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. I think it's on the website too, if I'm not mistaken. Right. I just wanted to make yeah. sure we're still looking Thank at the same can. document. That's all. We are. We are. Okay. Yeah. So are there any initial questions from the non-budget subcommittee members who... Any questions or I, thoughts? I guess I um, still had more questions about summer school and, how, you know, <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just... I mean, I'm glad that um, that we're looking at expanding our ESY, which is great. Um, I just don't know, like, are we going to be able to include more students in what we consider ESY this year? And is there a, is there any availability of us finding either either staff that are not necessarily our permanent staff, but other staff that can come in to do sort of targeted work with our students, like, you know, really intervention work to, you know, get kids back into um, back up to level, like even just if it was you know, like if there was language that we could take, you know, if the kids could take French class for six weeks over the summer, even if it wasn't a whole day, I would make my kids do it. You know I mean? one, so, thing, one thing we did talk at length about, and I'll <clears throat> let Susan address it and Keith, was how could we potentially leverage TECA to support students right. over the summer as well? Mm -hmm. um, and Keith pointed out they are technically a public schools and they don't operate during the summer. But I got to believe there's a lot of demand for that, and they are in the best position to be able to provide support during the summer. But there'd have to probably be some negotiation or some something tuition. I don't know what. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I'm looking more for like actual brick and mortar <laughs> in person in some in some capacity if there is any. No, I understand. I I think we're gonna have all great levels of different need, but right. yeah, yeah, but. Um, Go ahead, Susan. I'm sorry if you had an answer to that. Uh, I, I know that Kelly has put a lot of thought and worked with Victoria to 
try to fine tune what the program will look like. And certainly SEL invent interventions was one of the discussion points and topics. And correct me if I'm wrong, Keith, but that was adding some more um, counseling support to the program, some additional hours, correct? Right, we were doubling the amount of uh, guidance counselor times in there. Adjustment counselor, I thought it was. Adjustment counselor yep. time in there. And from, from the prior year, which is the first year we actually had, I think, is as much, or maybe the second year we had that much. I mean, there's, you know, again, we it's, the program is is designed for, for special needs students. I mean, it's, it's and so it makes it more difficult as well from a space standpoint. Um, you know, we don't have, as much as we think our schools are big, we're not a big school district. So for us to be able to um, offer certain types of enrichment activities, um, it, it's a challenge both for, for space and for the timing of us being able to get the schools ready for September. I mean, I always had the mantra of, you know, summers for me are about September. You know, I, I, my, my goal every year is to make sure that we are ready in September. Um, so like when very often a lot of groups often want to rent up the building, it's like, yeah, I, you can't pay me enough for me to have a problem in September. So, you know, the, I know there was one year, it's a while ago now, <laughs> everything's a while ago when you are here as long as I have been, but the, the, a while ago we had talked about having an actual summer school, a real enrichment program, we looked into it, but the scheduling of it, because we had to keep moving from this section of one building to that section, to that section, to then a different building with this cohort of students, because we had to keep them in a different place than we were in the process of cleaning. And so, you know, that would be a challenge for us in all honesty, so. And especially with ESY being extended by another week right. this year, so. Right. Okay. Um, Peter, can Peter or Susan, I, I, I'm sorry for asking this and putting one more thing on your plate, but I'm wondering, can you reach out to the other administrators in the area? I'm sure we're all struggling with the same questions. Is there something we can do together? Sort of like the collaborative, like, you know, we have these collaboratives, but is there something we can do specifically in the summer to help with remediating and, and working, you know, collaboratively with other districts. I, I you know, I just. Yeah, I, I did talk with some of the neighboring superintendents in a meeting I was on Wednesday after the budget meeting to see where they are in their assessment of needs for the similar conversations. And it sounds like we're all in the preliminary stages of thinking about this just because things are moving so fast and trying to keep up with now the um, increased opening and all those things. So it definitely is a discussion point and I certainly can bring that up as a talking point about collaborating and potentially coming up with programs, but then that would probably mean having them off site, you know, bringing kids to different buildings and that can get complicated too. But definitely yeah. open to it. And then just in terms of budget, this is a little bold, but I really feel like if, if the Department of Ed, if DESE found money for doing a pilot program for pool testing, then I'd like to see them find some money for some remediation, especially over the summer to help us. And I will advocate for that if, you know, if push we, comes to shove. We had, we did discuss that because it's, you know, it just seems so stunning right now that we're all grappling with this and that there's nothing out there ready to address it. But I mean, I think that's where we're hopeful that in this next round of stimulus funding that we're going to see something um, and, and, you know, sort of the word on the street is there's going to be more direct to education um, support. So I'm, I'm really hopeful, but I don't think that means we shouldn't be reaching out to Senator Spilka and, you know, Representative Dykema, et cetera, to be pushing and advocating for this because it's, it's, it's going to affect every district in the Commonwealth. Yeah. And the commission and did give us any money to me that they would give us through those means is only giving us our own money. Um, because there's what there's one pot of money that they peel off what they're going to do first and then give us the balance. True. Know, so. Yeah, they did. They, the commission did say in our most recent meeting, and like I said, the days are blurring together. So I can't remember what day that was, but it was the most recent one that there definitely is some guidance coming in. Um, there will be some funding coming for addressing learning gaps. So what that looks like and when I, that's, I am optimistic, as you said, Ian Louise, that some of the things we're talking about may not need to be met in our existing budget for that reason. But again, we have to wait until we find out what those numbers are. 
Um, John, before you ask your question, and Louise, I don't, so my recommendation is we actually don't vote until the 18th. I think, like, I don't. Oh, think okay, think great. So, I just... <laughs> yeah. So go ahead and go. go I, sorry, I'm on med delivery tonight, guys. <laughs> a half hour late, but Dawn, you have a quick question, or is it? Uh, nope, it's it's common. If you need to go, you can go because it's not really pertaining to. Uh, well, it's pertaining to what we just talked about with summer remediation and a collaboration between other schools. All right, go for it. I'll listen in. Okay, if, okay. Um, I like what you just brought up about a collaboration between other schools, but I also hear what um, Keith talked about in terms of our limitations with physical facilities, but could we leverage some of the technology that we're all outfitted with because of the pandemic and some of our other schools are as well? And I, I, know, I know we don't love Zoom, but it is a way that we could continue with some of this summer remediation work and maybe even do it collaboratively with other schools. And then we would not have the problem with physical facilities. The only thing I said to Kelly, only because, the, and I don't know if it would matter for summer, but the commissioner is saying that remote may not count at all to time on learning next year. Right now, he's allowing. So does that mean July 1, we can't use remote learning platforms? Or is it would it be safe to say we could because it's a summer program? I, that, again, it's just well, a question I have right now. Yeah, and I'm not sure it matters. It may um, not for the summer. summer. You know, it may it, not. That, right. That's what I was. Our goal is just to get these kids back on track, and you know, shift the shift the dial on on where they're at. So I don't really care as long as we don't go bankrupt. We, yeah. Get, you know. Yeah, it it may not be something we have to offer, but if it's a way for us to do it efficiently, like, that's a, yeah, that's kind of what I was getting to. Yeah. All right, I'm going to um, say goodnight. If anyone has any other questions for me or anything, just text me. If I can come back up, I'll leave it on. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good night. Um, okay, so any questions, you know, please reach out to Budget Subcommittee, um, and then they can come back to us on the 18th, and we can plan to vote then, and maybe we will have heard different information. Um, any other questions or anything before we move on? Okay. Um, do we have a newsletter? Um, I think we should hold off because I kind of scrambled to put something together um, in, anticipating we would do the budget tonight. But I think if we're going to wait on that, I would rather wait. Do you want to just announce the um, office hours and Catherine and I can put together, get it together a time and you could mail it, you could email it out on Monday. Yeah, we do need to do that. Okay, so what do I need to add for, um, hold on one second. You're doing the 13th, right? So Saturday the yeah. 13th, but also um, Stacey. So I just wrote a little, I just wrote a little blurb that I was gonna put in the newsletter, but we can just send that out separately. We'll just, we'll just send out, instead of sending out a newsletter, we'll just send yeah. out a blurb about office hours, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, but what do I need to tell people in terms of how do they get the Zoom link? What do I need to? So you have to create, the, you have to set up the meeting and then put that link into your, your yeah. email. Do you know Instagram. how to do that from your, you can do that from your calendar, Lisa. From your school committee calendar, you so, can actually set up a Zoom. So I'll be sending out the Zoom link with the announcement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can figure that out. I'm going to have to ask Lisa Aronian, but I will figure it out. <laughs> okay. Don? Okay. So I will try to, I will plan on sending that out on Monday. I have to put a note for myself. Lisa, would it make sense with your with the newsletter? Um, you have the anticipated timeline for the budget development process. All of that still looks good, except we have down as Thursday, March 18th, budget discussion if needed. Now we need it because we haven't voted yet. And it might even be budget discussion and full school committee vote on budget, right? But why not include some of the specifics about what the budget subcommittee has already voted, even though we have not yet? Because that's pretty much what we sent out last um, week. We already sent it out, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah it's okay. not that much different. Um, okay. And I think that I don't want to send out too many budget-only newsletters or budget-heavy newsletters because I think, you know, that then do, we kind of lose our audience. Do we want to include the fact that we voted tonight on um, moving ahead with 4th and 5th coming back by 
um, April yeah, 5th. I couldn't scramble to write that. I yeah, was trying to write okay. the budget stuff and I couldn't yeah. write that up quickly enough. So okay. I think that we should, I mean, Dr. Cuska is going to obviously be sending out information announcing that. So I think mm -hmm. we should just wait on that for now. Yeah. And then we can talk about the pooled testing and everything and you know how they yeah, I want to add that to a newsletter the next really time. really thoughtful on the pool testing. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Or not just our newsletter, but hopefully, you know, we can coordinate with Dr. Cusco on that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's definitely going to be a priority. So why don't we put in office hours and then where you start with here's our anticipated timeline for the budget development process and just update the one about um, March 18th that we'll discuss and vote Definitely. and then um, include the building a more equitable school district. Okay. Yeah, I can do that if you guys are okay I, with I, that. I think, I think I, so we yeah. should vote on it then because now it's starting to look like an actual newsletter. No, yeah, absolutely. So okay. All right, so let me, quick. are we ready to talk about the newsletter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's do that really quick. So I, I uh, shared the document with you guys like maybe 30 minutes ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what the only parts that I'll keep and the rest of the stuff I'll move to the next newsletter, but I'll keep um, this, this top blurb. So the school, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to have a blurb about office hours with the Zoom link. So that'll be the first thing. Okay. The second item, if you scroll down, will be the anticipated timeline for the budget development yep. process. And yep. I will out right now I will take out the if needed part for the 18th um and then item number three will be this building a more equitable school district which I just shamelessly stole Dr. Patello's language pretty much that he put online and put in a link did you ask permission from him I, I'm asking <laughs> permission now Dr. Patello. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Great. yeah, so I just, um, just to kind of, you know, cause it's not that easy to find on the website. I'm sure our new and improved website will be, um, much more user friendly, but you know, our current website can't necessarily find stuff that easily. So it's nice mm -hmm. to be able to just point people towards it. So Great. those will be the three items, office hours with a zoom link, the budget calendar, and this little blurb on um, equity and training. Okay, Lisa, do you want us to figure out about doing a, a in-person one as well and try to get that to you before, when you're sending it out yeah. Monday, before Monday? Yeah, I'm sending out Monday. Okay. If you guys want to, sure. Okay, well, I'll yeah. just try to look to see. I don't know how late it. Anthony's is open, but I, they are open. I just don't know how late they're open so we'll be i'll be able to figure it out and we'll so cynthia okay. you're going to join us yeah it, yeah Ka Catherine, you're coming too the three of us okay yeah. so the three of us will schedule we will yeah. schedule for Sounds something good. and i will get it to lisa okay so is there a motion to approve the newsletter with the addition of the in-person um office hours as presented tonight Moved by Cynthia. And with the subtraction of the budget stuff you see in the document oh, yes. right now, which I'm going to move to the next newsletter. As amended. Moved by Cynthia. Seconded by Second. Andy. Moved by Cynthia, seconded by Andy. All in favor, Mr. Morton? Yes. Mrs. Listevnik? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Mrs. Raffi? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, I apologize, Keith, I'm putting you on the spot. I left my cheat sheet of um, warrants that I signed in my car and um, my family took my car tonight. So <laughs> could you share the warrant? Sorry. <laughs> okay, good thing I took a picture of my phone of it. Um, <laughs> you, Sorry. A, you, you signed a, you see, see it looks like that. Uh, you signed a school bill warrant in the amount of three hundred and ten thousand dollars, three hundred and ten thousand thirty-eight dollars and fifty-six cents, of which five thousand five hundred fifty-two dollars and eighty-nine cents is related to COVID. Oopsie, just went back too far. And there's a cafeteria bill warrant in the amount of uh, in the amount of eleven thousand four hundred and seven dollars and forty-two cents, of which you signed. So With the total COVID. COVID amount was that 5,000 number, which I just can't get now. $5,552.89. Great. 
Thank you. Um, okay. Any other questions or any comments? So our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, March 18th. We have potentially the governance committee is, we're penciling them in. Um, we're gonna try and get them here. So again, um, please, you know, get your questions together. And I'm anticipating that um, Andy Wa will be emailing something to us in the next week or so. Um, communications, we'll talk about, uh, we'll have a communications agenda. We will have a um, spring reopening update. And we will have anything else that did you already say budget? Budget, yes. And newsletter. Newsletter. Okay, I just want to remind the committee, and you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to post this, so hopefully this won't be a problem. Monday night, um, the select board invited um, the school committee and finance committee to join them. Um, Senator Spilka and Rep Dykema will be giving their legislative update. So because I did not post, I really need you to send your questions to the town administrator so that he can ask the questions for you. And we will be silent participants Monday night instead of any participation. Um, it's Monday night at seven. I sent you the link. And I also shared with you um, a Google doc where um, I'm anticipating, because I've already gotten some questions about spring reopening, questions, concerns, I wanted to put them all in one place so that the administrators can see them, respond to them, be prepared to respond to them. And I shared it with the entire um, central office team and the um, building principals so that they all are hearing or seeing what we're hearing from the community. Um, so I hope we can just use that as sort of a central place to, to put um, all of our questions, et cetera, so that we're not inundating the administrators with email after email after email, because I'm the first one. I just started forwarding them, and then I said, you know what, mm, bad idea. So I just wanted a central place where we could put it all. So if you're getting emails, calls, questions, if you can um, compile them in there, that would be great. Um, any other Anything else? Stacey, I just, we're supposed to send our questions to Travis or to the yes. select board? Okay, thank you. Uh, to Travis. So the, the town administrator is going to try and streamline okay. you know, all the questions, et cetera. Um, and if you need his email address, let me know and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, so with that being said, um, it is 935. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Cynthia. Seconded by Lisa. Moved by Cynthia, seconded by Lisa. Roll call vote. Mr. Morton? Yes. Mrs. Lestevnik? Yes. Dr. Savard? Yes. Ms. Koshin? Yes. Ms. Naborski? Yes. Mrs. Raffi? Yes. Thank you all very much. Good night. Stay well. And we will obviously be in touch very soon. Thank you Bye, all. everybody. My keys, my feelings.